Thank you. It is February 12th, 2022, and this is our first town council retreat for the new council. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021, this meeting is being conducted via um, in, in person, but also remote means. Uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I am calling the meeting of the Amherst Town Council to order at 914. I'll call upon each councilor by name. At that time, you should unmute your mic and say present, and then please mute your mic again. Um, Shalini Balmion. I'm present. Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothier. Present. Lynn Griesmer is present. Mandy Johannick. Present. Anika Lopes. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Dorothy Pam. We use this mic. Yep. Okay. Like the old times. Um, Hold it. Present. Uh, thank you. Pam Rooney is hoping to join us later. She's on her way to Rhode Island to become a grandmother. Yeah. Kathy Shane. Here. Andy Steinberg. Here. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker. Here. Okay, and I wanna check because we have three other, four other people in the room, uh, although we have actually five. I wanna first of all, thank Sean for coming in this morning and helping us all get it set up uh, and also setting the room up in advance uh, so that we could be seriously socially distanced and still be together. Um, we're joined today by Paul Bachelman, town manager. Present. Um, <laughs> Dave Zomack, assistant town manager. Uh, Athena O'Keefe, our town our clerk to the town council. And I am going to now introduce Erin Cohn, and she's going to say a few words about herself and then turn it back to me. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I actually have a slide to introduce myself. Let's see if we can make that actually work. Here we go. All right. Well, I'm very excited to be here with you today. Um, I am currently the director of the Wordle Center for Leadership at Smith College, uh, where I facilitate leadership development courses and workshops um, with a real emphasis on collaborative leadership. Um, before being in that role, I served as a senior partner at an organization called Leadership and Design, where I worked as a um, consultant facilitator um, to design and facilitate leadership development uh, uh, experiences, initiatives for K-12 teachers and school leaders, particularly with an emphasis on um, human-centered design as an approach to change making. Um, I'm also a parent of teenagers, and I, so I have a 14-year-old daughter and uh, two stepchildren who are also in, the, in high school. And then I live part-time in Northampton, part-time in Vermont. And you can see that's my uh, woods in my backyard of my little dog, um, Hops. So that's me. Thanks for having me today. I'm looking forward to spending the day with you. Great, thank you so much. So uh, leading up to today, um, I first got a call actually even before we had the new council sworn in from Michelle Miller and from uh, Anna. And they asked, "Can we? are we gonna have a retreat? Could we talk about it? And I'm going, well, we can talk about it. I'm not president yet, but let's talk about it. So we began talking about this. And so I wanna turn it over to the two of them to talk a little bit about what we, what the goals are and what they envisioned and what we tried to put together. So let's start, I guess, Michelle. Let me just get this a little closer here, I think. Yeah, so I think uh, Anna and I were talking after election and I think the two themes were recognizing the extraordinary amount of work that the previous council had accomplished and also recognizing that there was a lot more work to do. <laughs> um, and then recognizing that to do that work and to serve our community, um, it would be important for us as counselors and colleagues to be able to work really well together. Um, and so we, that was sort of the impetus for wanting to um, pursue the retreat. 
And then we had this meeting, I think in December uh, to, to, to talk about what that might look like. And both Anna and I had looked at some different models, uh, looked at uh, what might be possible for us, what would benefit this particular group. And uh, I think that's sort of, that's, that's where we started. And in that initial meeting, we talked about how we could uh, gain the input of the council leading up to this day that we're now here for. So, and then Anna will take it from there. Yeah, so in terms of the content, what we talked about was, you know, what Michelle mentioned around the initial figuring out how to collaborate, how to be in process together. And then we also wanted to spend some time talking about processes that have yet to be defined. So things like how to bring something that you're passionate about and turn it into something that comes before the council, right? There's not really a set process for that. Some people have, have figured it out very well. Some of us are kind of like, maybe I'll try this, maybe I'll try that. And so we wanted to spend part of our time together really thinking, getting to know each other and, and establishing that collaborative process, which I believe Aaron will talk us through the, the plan for today, but that's part of the plan. The other part of the plan is to really think about what is our process and where might we be focusing our efforts. So while we're not going to get into actually solving those problems in this session, um, we're going to think about how we might apply a process to these issues moving forward. So those are the two areas. Did I miss anything, Michelle? Does that cover it? Cool. Um, yeah, so that's that's the plan for today. Um, and then Aaron is, I will just speak because I have seen Aaron facilitate before, very good at talking about both collaboration and process. And so is a great fit for this in terms of bringing, um, bringing humans to the middle of it, really thinking about our needs in this space and what we each bring uh, in moving forward together. So I'm excited. Okay. And then we received uh, suggestions for facilitators from I think four or five counselors. There were six of them. Uh, and so at that point, Shalini and Anna and I started interviewing, we interviewed two and we settled on Aaron and then we began having meetings and Michelle was able to join us for the last of those. So we kind of came full circle on putting today's, today, today's agenda together. I just want to mention, we will not take any votes. There may be things that at some point in the future, I certainly would imagine might come to a council meeting for a vote but that's not the purpose of a retreat and so forth. We do have the retreat is open to the audience. Right now, there is nobody in the audience. So it's a public meeting. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Aaron. All right, thank you so much. Okay, great. Well, actually I'll do these first. Okay. Um, should I pause or just, okay, all right. Okay, great, no, not to worry, okay. All right, so I wanna start us off to kind of lay the landscape of what we're up to today for, the, for this retreat. Um, and this is sort of a strategy for sharing all of these pieces with you called ORS, that's the acronym for it, but it basically stands for Outcomes, Agenda, Roles, and Rules. Um, and so this is a chance to just really think about what are we up to, why are we here, um, and, and what are the roles that each of us is gonna play in this work together. So in terms of outcomes, um, we've discussed these a little bit, Anna and Michelle touched on these, um, but the first is to create connections. Um, this is a, a new group. Some of you are new to this role, some of you are not, but anytime you add new members, you are a new group, right? So you are forming as a group um, and that forming process requires an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit better. And so we're gonna um, engage in a little bit of creating connections. Um, another outcome that we hope to have for, from today is to clarify collective norms and values. We'll talk about what those terms actually mean, um, but to really get a sense of how do we want to work together with each other and what matters to us. And then the other goal for today um, is to start to consolidate your priorities and to design a process or processes, processes, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, um, for pursuing those goals. Um, obviously, we are not going to converge on like what are the priorities and exactly how are we going to you know, pursue policy today, that's the work of governing, right? Um, but uh, at least trying to think about how can we do this work together productively is, is what we're up to today. So our agenda, um, we'll do a little bit of an icebreaker to get to know each other better. Um, I'm gonna share some concepts for healthy group engagement to kind of set the stage for the work for the day. Um, we will have a conversation about procedure, procedures, norms, and values. We're gonna kind of look at some of those procedures that you already have in place some of your values and, and try to reflect on them and make sense of them. Um, we've, you've already started to set priorities, but we wanna kind of look at how those priorities are clustered together and, um, and what, what do we notice from those priorities. 
Um, we're gonna spend some time designing process and then we'll kind of close. Obviously there's gonna be breaks in the middle of all this. So just so you know, it's not like we're just gonna, you know, motor through this whole thing from here until two o'clock and you're captive. So um, please make sure to, to uh, take breaks as you need them. I will also have formal breaks for us. Okay, so in terms of roles, your role today as a counselor is to listen and reflect. One thing you'll notice about my facilitation style is that I like to engage people in individual reflection and conversation, um, because I find if we're just in conversation, we don't really have time to collect our thoughts and some of us process at different speeds than others. And so I would encourage you when I invite you to reflect, to use the paper, um, to jot down notes and you know, take the time to do that reflection. And I'll set a timer for the reflection time and then share out. Um, and so we'll kind of toggle in, in between reflection and conversation. Um, would encourage you to share your perspectives and ideas today. So that's your role is to be a, sort of an active participant. My role is to steer the conversation and also to bring us out of the weeds. And so I, I wanna foreground this from the beginning and normalize that there may be moments where I have to interrupt us because we're sort of getting caught in the details, you all have issues that you care deeply about. Um, and sometimes it's easy to get kind of caught up in those details. And there may be moments where I need to pull you back up and out and say, okay, this is really great conversation, but we need to really think about what kinds of processes are we, you know, can we use? And so please note that there may be moments that I do that and you may hate me and that's why I'm here, right? I'm not a part of this group. And so you're allowed to do that. <laughs> um, Every sort of meeting, you know, to, it's nice to create a set of rules to kind of use together. And these are some that I like to use with groups. Um, the first is to take space and make space. This is another, you know, you might've heard this, uh, this norm as step in or step out. Um, it's just uh, inviting you to both step forward and share your voice, but also make sure that you're leaving space for other voices as well. We're gonna talk a little bit in a moment about listening, um, but would encourage you to listen to understand rather than to listen to respond, right? So listening to understand is about really, you know, stopping and really trying to think about what are, what are my hearing from the, the people whose voices are, are being um, presented. I'd encourage you to be more curious than certain today. This is like one of my life mantras um, that in moments where I think I really know the answer that I try to kind of step back and, and take some curiosity on and think about how might I um, you know, complicate the way that I look at these things. And so that's uh, an invitation to you to do that today. Um, and then finally, be aware of the impact of your identity on your experience. And I would say identities actually, because we, we all carry various um, identities and they shape um, what we bring to the work. And so I would just encourage you to be thinking about that. Okay, we are in a retreat. We are not physically in a retreat. We're not in a separate space, but I want to invite us like, to cross a threshold into a retreat space together. And so the first reflection prompt I want to bring to you is sort of a centering. And I'm going to ask you just for a, take a couple of minutes to jot down on paper an answer to these two prompts. You are not going to share these out loud. This is just a manner, a, a moment for you to kind of check in with yourself. But what is one thing that you are bringing with you into this space in order to be a productive sort of member of this group as you're engaging in this reflection work together? And then what is one thing you're leaving behind? Okay, so what are you trying to kind of leave at the doorway, you know, push it out the exit, and then what are you bringing in through the entry? So just take a minute or two to, to jot down um, you know, you can even have one or two for each of these categories. And when you're ready, you can just look up. That helps me know that you're done.
Okay, great. So I would encourage you to keep those in mind as you're making your way through. Sometimes it's nice in groups to share these, but um, we're gonna do actually a different share around for our icebreaker. Okay, so um, for an icebreaker, we're gonna start with our own values. And I think that's a really good place to start what matters to us personally. So I'm gonna encourage you again, to just take a minute to um, look at this list of values words. And I'm gonna ask you to choose three values that most resonate with you. And I encourage you, if you don't like these words and there's a word you like better, to choose that word. There's nothing magical about this list of words. Um, they're here though to give you a, you know, a set of things to get started with, um, but choose three that most resonate with you. And in choosing, that doesn't mean that like, if you don't choose fun, you don't value fun. It's really more, you know, try to pick three that really matter to you. And in a moment, what we're going to do is um, go around the room and share what three did we choose, but then why did you choose one? So we're not going to talk about all three. We're just going to share out the why on one of them. Um, but take a couple minutes, look through these, pick three, and then we'll do a share around of your why about one of those. Okay, so let's give it like 30 more seconds. Again, I'm asking you to summarize everything that matters to you in a very short amount of time, but. <laughs> And Lynn, what do you think is the best way to do a share out? Is it, should we do it through roll call order or when folks feel ready? What do you think might be the best way to do it? Whoops. People could either raise their hand because they all have the raise hand function mm -hmm. or we could do what we do for votes. And that is I keep rotating the orders around and around and around. <laughs> Alicia wants the latter. <laughs> I think it's because she comes at the end. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the um, in the order that we do roll call. Okay, that makes sense. And that I think okay. is probably more efficient than we're not. Yeah. All right, okay, so excellent. We start with Shalini Balmilm. I think if you share the three words you chose, but then just the why about one. And if you can be kind of brief, you know, we have a lot to do today, but I also want to give us a chance to hear from each other in terms of what, what matters. So I would just encourage you to kind of find that balance. Well, let's go one minute. Yeah. All right, so many words. Um, I chose honesty. Uh, inclusion and understanding. And um, wait, I chose so many. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to go with, um, I'll say one thing about truth and honesty. I love Gloria Steinem's thing. She says that uh, the truth will set you free, but at first it'll piss you off. So I think maybe I'll lead with that one that uh, sometimes it's hard to say what's true to us as counselors because there's so much of uh, anti-sentiment against it and it feels like saying that you're going to lose the support or trust of people and yet 
that's the struggle constantly is what is my truth in this situation. I may not be right, but that I need to say that so I can learn of something else and something new. So what is my truth? And, uh, and I think if we can all speak our truth, I mean, I'll just speak for myself, but yeah. So when I speak my truth, I sleep better. I learn more. I'm willing to say, I don't know what it is. So I guess that is an important value then that leads to understanding, better understanding, seeking to understand different perspectives and why people are thinking the way they're thinking. Pat. <laughs> um, we were supposed to pick three. I picked one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> um, a multiple of three. So I'm gonna read them all and I'll, then I'll talk about one. Collaboration, risk-taking and courage, curiosity, justice, and equity. Uh, and the one I wanna sit with is curiosity. Um, it's in some ways what drives me. Uh, I'm very interested in people's stories, what, they, what they've what they lived, what they've experienced, who they are. Um, and I find that if I allow myself to be openly curious, uh, it bypasses the way I judge myself or I judge others. Um, and it makes life more interesting to just wonder about what is going on. And it leads me into places I didn't expect or anticipate. And I think that's a good thing. Okay, uh, Anna. So I did follow the rules. Uh, <laughs> I have all with love, uh, growth, hope and curiosity. And for me, growth, uh, I'm gonna explain growth. I think remembering that it's okay to, to learn new things and shift your mind, right? Like to change your mind on things, not change your mind, but educated changes. Um, and that we're always learning, right? Like none of us are here to be experts. Our role is to learn, our role is to grow and change. And so if we're not doing that, we're doing something wrong. Uh, and then, you know, part of this is in the curiosity, right? So around growth, challenging my reactions to being challenged, you know, working on always, um, momentum, right? Like always moving forward. I think if momentum was on that list, I would, I would choose that too, because I think it's really, it's about that progress and whether it's slow or fast, whether it's hard or easy, um, growth is, is key to this. Yeah. Uh, so I go next and I, I chose truth slash honesty. Um, I chose hope and I chose contribution and I'm going to uh, focus on hope. And one of the reasons that um, I'm here today is because I have continually fallen into all kinds of challenges and I keep hoping and I come back out of them. And making sure that I can hope also means that um, with hope, it allows me to feel like there's still a reason to contribute. So there you go. Mandy Jo. So I chose service, openness, and curiosity. Um, openness, I guess, goes a little bit to some of what Anna was saying about growth, but I took it as openness, an openness to other opinions, other ideas, being willing to change, but also an openness of your own opinions and being willing to say what you're thinking in an open meeting without fear of the consequences and all of that, I think. One thing I learned in the last council was if we can't be open, we can't have conversations. Um, and we need to have those conversations. If we're afraid to say something, we have problems. Um, so that's why I chose openness um, as one of them. Okay, Anika. So I have authenticity slash integrity, the popular hope and vision. I will sit with authenticity. I think that just in, in all things, it's important to center and really focus on who we are, why we are, and bring that forward in all that we do. Okay, Michelle. <laughs> all right. 
Uh, I chose authenticity, compassion, and courage. And I'm going to share about compassion. Um, I have found in my life experiences that working, practicing to relieve my own suffering and also practicing to relieve the suffering of others has allowed my heart to stay open um, and has created more peace in my life. So that's mine. Okay, Dorothy. Well, I'm five values here. Um, and they're gonna sound familiar, so you can draw your conclusions. Authenticity, courage, creativity, initiative, and integrity. And it's because I think it matters what you do and say. And I think we have to be out front, see what's wrong and where you wanna go and figure out how to get there. Great. Uh... Pam will join us later. Well, don't worry, we'll make her tell us in council meeting. Uh, Kathy. Uh, as I looked at these, I had to cluster them to get to three because some of the words, and I heard other people doing it too, but it's um, several words went together for me. So I'm gonna only do three, but they're gonna be clusters. <laughs> Okay, so accountability, sustainability go together for me. And, and, and I must say, I'm thinking of this in terms of my role as a counselor, not the way I am as a parent necessarily um, and outside. Creativity, learning, growth, and openness all went to me because I don't think you can do any of those without them. And then patience and integrity uh, both go to me because I think and I'll talk about the last one, um, having worked on issues that took forever to get done, um, I found that if you had integrity as you were working on them, you needed patience to get them done. Um, and it was, it goes with the openness and curiosity that there's ways of moving to, to get to yes, but it may not happen in a day. Okay, Andy. Hi, good morning. Um, I'm going to start taking just one sentence and say that I'd much prefer to be with you in person. And I will explain in another time in another context why it was not possible today. But um, the words that I <clears throat> chose were. Um, Two of them went together first, equity and justice. Second is integrity. The third is sustainability. And the one thing that I will um, comment on, since we're invited only to speak to one, is sustainability. Um, I have always felt that serving on any elected body, um, we're here to serve the people who put us into office and the community that they represent. And we owe it to them to make sure that we are creating a sustainable community. That's why we're here. Okay, thanks. Jennifer? Okay, thank you. Um, so my words, and one of them does have three, is service and inclusion, and then I had to add collaboration and community. And then my third word was integrity. And I think I'll focus on service. Um, I guess as a child of the 60s and 70s, I was can always hear the mantra in my mind of if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. So I think that's how I get to service. And I think to accomplish you know, to get to where you're hoping to go in serving, you need collaboration, inclusion, and integrity. And I guess what Andy just said really um, resonated because I think sometimes I kind of harp on the same themes, but I do feel a real sense of responsibility to the constituents who put me here, you know, to, to make progress on um, the values that are important to them, which gets, which is, pretty much community sustainability. Thanks. 
Great, Alicia. Um, so the words I chose were respect, equity, um, and then my third one, which is one that I made up, but is to me a combination of a lot of the words on here. And that's the one I'm going to explain and that's grace. Um, and the way that I look at that, grace. And so the way that I look at this in terms of meeting and working with other people is allowing everyone the space to be human. And so allowing people to make mistakes and allowing people to grow um, and allowing people to exist in a space in whatever way it is that they need to exist in that space and to not hold judgment and to allow people to have and experience adverse things and to not think of them as lesser than. Great. All right. All right. That was everybody. Thank you so much for engaging that and putting your full your whole selves into that exercise. The thing I love about this exercise is the ways that people choose to break the rules. The rules are there just to get you started, right? But it's really just an opportunity for you to start to think about it. And you can learn a lot about each other in terms of how each of you tackled that. Um, so thank you for engaging fully in it. Yes. Oh. Are we willing to have folks share? Are you all willing to share? Have you had a chance to think about it? So I do think this is about the council. So I leave it in the council and you're building your relationship and I have a different role. So I leave that up to the president. Okay. All right. It, but I'm willing to share whatever you want to do. Okay. <laughs> it's a, an opportunity for future conversation, perhaps. Awesome. Sounds good. Okay. So I want to just take a few minutes to share a few things about group engagement um, from some of the, the reading and research that I've done on this, um, just to kind of frame uh, what, you know, healthy uh, collaborative work looks like. Um, and I have three main concepts for you that I want to share. And this is just a little short segment, but I thought it might be helpful to just give some of this um, framing for you. Um, and I, I have mushrooms because I'm a big fan of the way that fungi collaborate in the forest. And so if you want to talk to me about that later, I'm happy to do that with you, but it's really fascinating. Oops, excuse me. Um, okay, so concept number one is that diverse groups create better outcomes. And so there's all kinds of research on how diverse teams, especially uh, in science, for whatever reason, diverse teams of scientists actually end up being more productive and more creative the more diverse the group is. Um, and so that research helps us understand that it is in our difference that we can actually find productive and creative outcomes. Um, and so it's really honoring that diversity um, as opposed to kind of trying to, to step away from it or to find consensus or, or uh, connection between our group. Um, diversity takes many forms. In some ways that diversity is identity, but there's also cognitive diversity. Um, and cognitive diversity is really sort of how do we approach problems? How do we imagine process? Um, there's kind of cognitive diversity around neuro um, diversity. And so just recognizing that there's lots of different ways that we can um, be different from each other and that those differences can bring a lot to the table when we're trying to work together. The one thing that makes it challenging is that um, the more diverse a group, sometimes the less productive it feels. Um, and that's because we as humans crave consensus and belonging, right? So when we are in a group that is diverse, we are more likely to experience conflict and abrasion against each other. And sometimes that feels less productive when in fact, if we can find our way through that difference and through that abrasion, we can actually be more productive um, and, and more creative. And so just sort of recognizing that the feel of diverse collaboration is sometimes um, very different than what we crave because consensus feels good. Um, and then the last piece of this uh, sub, you know, the last sub point here is that in order to become productive within a diverse uh, group, it requires sort of the active normalizing and harnessing of difference. And so being uh, comfortable with and actually craving that difference among us to kind of be open to hearing other people's perspectives and to be patient with the fact that our ways of doing things might come up against each other. So that's concept number one, diverse groups create better outcomes. 
The second concept I want to bring forward um, is that there's a difference between productive and unproductive dissent and conflict. We need dissent and conflict in, um, in all group processes, um, but there's different forms of that, right? And so we need authentic dissent in order to avoid groupthink. And groupthink is basically the sort of one person brings an idea and we all kind of come up behind it. Um, and that there's all kinds of really interesting research about how that happens within groups because socially, we wanna feel a sense of belonging. And so sometimes we quiet our own um, uh, voices and opinions as a result of that social pressure. Um, so I would encourage you to, to normalize dissent when dissent is happening. And I mean, you're a town council, so I think dissent's not a problem for you would be my guess. Um, it's when I'm working with like student undergraduate groups where they're like, we don't wanna dissent, right? But so I just, you know, to be thinking about how do we avoid group think, but also, how do we engage in dissent in ways that, um, that are healthy and productive? So healthy conflict or dissent looks like movement. It looks like curiosity. It looks like asking each other questions. Um, and sometimes those questions can have difficult emotions behind them, but to do that in a way that honors each other's humanity, um, each other's experience, um, that's all part of healthy conflict. Unhealthy or unproductive conflict is when we lose sight of our shared values. Um, we lose, yeah, basically when conflict is the destination, right? We find ourselves engaging in conflict for the sake of conflict. Um, and unproductive conflict also often looks like binary thinking. It's us versus them, my faction versus that faction. Um, we're either gonna have this solution or that solution, right? That binary, the more heated a conflict becomes, the more binary it becomes. And so it's something to watch for in your work together. Are, are we moving into a binary here? And if so, how can we find a third way? Um, and how can we do that in a way that uh, kind of allows us to have an understanding of the, the larger picture? Um, and then I would also just encourage you to think about um, argument as actually the place where ideas form. Like that's actually productive if you can do it well. Um, and I just love this, uh, this quote by these two psychologists, um, Hergo Mercier and Dan Sperber, um, which is that reasoning makes us smarter only when we practice it with other people in argument, right? And so um, if you know anything about the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, um, they actually had this amazing relationship as brothers where they just fought like crazy. Like all they did was argue with each other and try constantly to bat each other's ideas down um, so that they could build and learn and, and create a, an airplane, right? And that's how they got there. Um, and so just thinking about how do we create that kind of productive dissent within our group? So that's concept number two. There's a difference between productive and unproductive dissent and conflict. And then finally, the third concept I wanna leave you with, here, let me see if I can move this again. This is always the challenge when you're presenting on Zoom. There we go. Um, listening. I just wanna leave you with listening as like such an important skill. Um, and if you're interested in reading about listening, I would encourage you to check out this book by Kate Murphy, You're Not Listening. Um, it's a really wonderful read um, about the art of listening um, and it is a crucial collaborative skill. And so much of our training in our lives is about like public speaking and having an opinion and being a knower, right? Being the one who has the answers. And I would say that as public officials, that's probably very true that there are expectations of you to be able to show up with the answers. Um, and I just would encourage you to cultivate your listening um, instead of, you know, not instead of, but in addition to that. Um, and so there's multiple pieces of this that I find fascinating. Um, the first is the concept of the speech thought differential, which is that our thoughts happen faster than, our list, uh, than people talk, right? So when you're listening to a person talk, this is probably happening to you in the last five minutes while I've been talking, your brain is going other places, right? Because you get bored and <laughs> your brain just sort of takes a, a vacation, right? And so part of the, pro the art of good listening is learning how to turn off that tendency to mentally go somewhere else. Um, half the time we're thinking about how can I respond to what this person is saying, right? So remember I was talking about listening to understand versus listening to respond. Um, so often we miss what the person is saying because we're already thinking, like waiting for them, like, come on, come on, come on, I've got this thing I wanna say, so I'm gonna say it. And you don't hear the, the, the second half of what they're about to say. Or you think you know what they're gonna say and so you fill that in and don't actually listen to what they do say. 
So I already kind of mentioned this, there's a big difference between listening to understand versus listening to respond. And that's kind of what I was discussing right there. Um, the other thing to think about is active versus passive listening. Passive listening is sort of sitting back and assuming that listening is about absorbing. Active listening is about asking actual curious questions to try to draw out more, right? And so as you are engaging in conversation and dialogue and debate with each other, um, you know, instead of it being, here's my point, here's your point, let's battle those two things out. You know, if there is a, a point or a, a perspective to try to learn more about that, right? Be active in the way that you try to draw each other out um, and, and gain more information about why, why does my fellow counselor believe this? What is the background? What are they bringing to the table? Um, and kind of engage in that active listening together. And then for me, this is a really um, important quote from Miles Davis, which is, um, if you understood everything I said, you'd be me in the sense that like, we can't ever fully understand each other. The way each of us uh, brings words to the table and to our you know, conversation is different. And what we mean by those things is um, uh, that's sort of the beauty of being human and also one of the biggest challenges of it. So something to think about as you're working together. Um, so those are sort of three main concepts that I wanted to bring to you just to kind of frame our work together. Um, but I also want to not spend this whole time lecturing at you. I just wanted to kind of share those things with you to frame your work and then um, uh, start to think about our own norms and values and procedures that you have um, as a team. So I wanna start by looking at what these things actually mean. So what are norms? What are values? These are words that we use often, um, but it can help us to define what they actually mean. So norms are the behaviors that we engage in regularly with each other as we work together as a group, okay? So we might have a set of rules of procedure. I know you have a formal set of rules of the procedure and you've set those in place to say, these are the things that we're gonna do with each other. Um, norms are a little different than those rules in the sense that norms are the things that we actually do with one another. It's the actual behaviors that we have accepted um, as sort of the way that we engage with one another. And sometimes the rules we set for ourselves and the norms that we practice don't match up fully, right? And so you might set a norm that um, people won't be on their phones during meetings, but if people are on phones during meetings, the norm is actually people can be on their phones during meetings because there's no sort of enforcement about that, right? Um, and so there's a distinction between kind of what do we actually engage in as norms together um, and what are the rules we wanna set for ourselves? Values on the other hand are kind of what do we care about what are the ethics that guide us? Um, and so we've already done a little bit of work with values. And so I wanna give you a chance this morning to really look at what are our rules? How do they translate into norms? What are our values? Do they map to the, the rules of procedure that we have with ourselves um, or for ourselves and spend some time with that? So here's what you're gonna do. You've got in your packet here, um, a set of values and procedures so you've got the Amherst Town Council Rules of Procedure. And I'm gonna invite you to find the values. Which page are they in? Okay. Yeah, I think they're highlighted. There's the values, yeah. Page 29. Okay, so there should be 10 of those. And just on a piece of paper, I'm gonna have you draw out this continuum, okay? Um, on the left side of this continuum is inward facing. And on the right side is outward facing. And just take a minute to read through these adopted town council statement of values. I'm gonna have you plot where you think each of these 10 values goes on the inward facing to outward facing continuum. So a value that is especially inward facing might be something like healthy balance. You can put healthy balance wherever you want. I'm just using this as an example, but what are an inward facing value is something that governs our work with each other as a town council. Outward facing is more on the end of, this is related to how we want to engage with the town and our constituencies, okay? everything is going to be gray, right? It's not one or the other. That's why we're doing this along a spectrum, but do your best to just jot down along the continuum where you think each of these 10 values goes. And so I'm going to give you a few minutes to do that and you can kind of look up and let me know when you're ready.
That's a great question. So the question, can you, can you ask the question in your mic? Uh, the question was whether we are rating, uh, putting this in the way we are, it was intended or in the way we're actually practicing it or acting on it. And I don't have a good answer to that. So that's a great question for us to talk about in terms of the differences between practice versus intention and how do we wanna think about that moving forward? So I'd say do your best. Um, and, and then maybe we can bring that up as part of the conversation. We give it one more minute. I see some folks are still kind of thinking and considering. Anyone need another moment? Okay, great. All right, so I just wanna open up conversation um, and I can kind of move these around. Obviously there's no right answer to this question necessarily, but we have these on a jam board and I can kind of move them as we're considering, you might make a statement of like, I really think that community participation belongs, you know, where, where do you think it belongs on the spectrum? It's just a chance for us to start to kind of think about how do these map in terms of what faces inward in our relationship versus outward? Um, so I open the floor to whoever would like to contribute. Anika. So I envisioned looking at this, I thought I you know, could easily move them over, but I did envision more of uh, like an infinity circle, whereas I think that they're both uh, equally as important on both sides, though I think you know, maybe creative, uh, creativity and innovation, diversity, inclusion and equity and teamwork lay, lay heavier on the side of the council and our work that we can't put that responsibility to uh, the community. But I found it very difficult to separate them as I think they're both equally important on both inward and outward work. Yeah, Shalini. I love the infinity symbol because the way I thought of it was like, it's everything seems to be in the middle for me. Like we are working within, but it's, because we're also reflecting what the people need. So to me, it was in the middle, but I do like the infinity. Uh, what I also felt was the internal seemed more like what is our small world? So when we say we're working even with the community or whether we're working within who's in the in, inner group. And so even when it's community and we say it's the community, but the community is still our little world of community and doesn't really and into the larger. So to me, the inner versus outer seems a very important piece because we think we're talking about the outer when we're still talking about a subset of the outer. Do you know what I mean? 
like our inner world is still who we can sit, who we interact with, who we listen to. And then we feel that that's the whole community because we have heard from everyone who's in our inner world and we feel everyone has spoken, but that's still a microcosm of the bigger community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anna. So I needed to define them in my head. And so I, I think I followed the way that you explained it, Erin. And the way I looked at it as inward facing is kind of like we are now, we're literally all facing into the center and it's this group of people, right? And so for me, that was um, the ones on that end. I had healthy balance, teamwork. And that's not to say that we don't work in teams with our communities, but I was thinking of this really as, as we define our work, we have work that we need to engage in in order to be productive together. And then we have work that we do that is, um, everything is in service of our community, but that is literally like we turn around and say it to the, to the rest of the people, right? So um, the ones that I did think were strongly on the outward facing end and are less about how we work together and more about what we do are the fiscal responsibility, environmental sustainability, community participation, and then like slightly less in or slightly more towards the middle of the spectrum was culture. Um, because I think that that's very much a um, outward facing responsibility that we need to focus on, but it also impacts and is, is and drives how we work together. So that, that was kind of my, um, and then in smack in the middle, I had DEI, transparency and respect. And then the other two are kind of where I had them on my as well. Great, there's Anna's map in case you wanna see, see it visualized. <laughs> well, I was gonna just give one and then I was like, wait, I'm leaving everything else out, so. Great, inclusion. Yeah, I'm curious if others would organize this differently. Yeah, it's Alicia, right? Yep. Um, so I'm just already finding it very interesting because I think we all interpreted this like slightly differently. Um, and so I was looking at it a little bit more similarly to how Anna was looking at it in terms of like inward facing is like us here right now in our meetings and outward facing is more of like our interactions with the community and sort of us getting our information to bring back to this group. Um, and so I had a similar thing and also I was doing it as like a timeline and not as like all of these things go in one place <laughs> so I was having a little bit of a harder time like oh which one comes first mm -hmm. um which one's closer but I had for the inward facing um healthy balance teamwork creativity innovation and respect um and then in the middle kind of I had diversity equity and inclusion fiscal responsibility, environmental sustainability, um, and transparency and culture. I had all somewhere in the middle. And those ones I had a little bit of a harder time because I think they go both ways. And so transparency is very important for us when we're working, because if we all don't understand the processes and what we're doing, then we won't get very far. But it's also very important outward facing to the community so that they can be involved and understand what's going on also. Um, and I felt similarly in terms of like fiscal responsibility, that's really kind of our work, like the community themselves aren't so much so having a say in how we approach the fiscal deals that we look into, but it does affect them. And so that's why I put it there and as well as environmental sustainability, because we really need the community to work with us on this, but we are the ones really making the major calls when it comes to those things. Um, and then all the way on the other end, I had community participation. Great, thank you. Yeah, I can't actually see, is it Mandy, Joe? It's Mandy. Mandy, okay. Um, so I approached it the same way Alicia and um, Anna did, um, but more with a timeline too. And I had a problem with the timeline because <laughs> things in the middle get middle-like. Um, but I agreed with both of them that healthy balance and teamwork were definitely inward facing. Um, and community participation was my most outward facing. And then that's where then the next seven kind of start mixing up. And I had more inward facing the environmental sustainability and fiscal responsibility um, because I felt like those were more um, what we have to do as a council. Um, and so our job is to be fiscally responsible. Um, and that's a role we have to report, I thought, uh, you know, as sort of our responsibility towards 
the community. Um, more in the middle, I had creativity, innovation, culture, res and respect, and all. Um, and those three, I thought, really were the most even on which go both ways. Um, we have to respect each other in our own work, but we also, I hope, have to expect respect from the community um, in the way they interact with us. Um, they, they can not like what we do, and that is perfectly fine, but I hope as a council, we expect a, an interaction that is respectful, um, even if people don't like what we're doing. Um, I think we want creativity and innovation both with us, but also with what people are bringing toward to us. Um, and similar with the cult culture is the one I wasn't really sure that that belongs to the town, I thought, but yet we're as a council probably holding on to it and promoting it. And then the other two, transparency and diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, again, transparency is, I felt more of something that not only do we have a responsibility for, but we have to, that, that the community expects that from us. And so they're gonna hold us to it, which is why I put it more towards the outward facing. And diversity, equity, inclusion is, it, I, I struggled with where to put it actually, because I, I, you know, it's both, right? We want the diversity of the participation of the residents and that's the outward facing seeking it. Um, but we also have a big job to do to make that happen. So I wasn't sure exactly where to put that one. Thank you. Additional perspectives, yeah, Jennifer. Okay, <clears throat> my chart looks just like Mandy's. <laughs> <laughs> Almost, yeah, and I put, so for transparency, you know, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, I, there was some I put in both, you know, inward facing and outward facing, mm -hmm. but it basically came out. It's pretty same. similarly, yeah. Yep. So we've got this, we're sort of emerging a, a middle cloud here, right? And one of the things that is helpful about thinking about this as a spectrum, again, trying to pull you out of binary thinking, these, these values don't necessarily just govern us internally and they don't just govern us externally, but they might have different valence depending on how we're understanding how they govern us internally versus how they govern us externally, right? So being able to be clear about that together and to have kind of thought through some of that is helpful, yeah. Are there others who wanna uh, comment? Yeah, Shalini. Um, in case anyone else hasn't spoken, Shalini was offering an opportunity for others to share who hadn't yet. Yep. I had uh, almost everything divided up as outward and inward. Um, I believe for me, it's almost like a pyramid in diversity, inclusion, and equity, the top of the pyramid. That feels to me like the most important element we can deal with around race, around class, around gender, uh, around uh, economic status, because those experiences current and in the past affect every other way that we are. Um, so that to me is the most, uh... and then for healthy balance, <laughs> I have it in inward, but we don't practice that. <laughs> um, and, uh, in terms of transparent, a, a lot of them I, I have in and out. So um, I'm not sure exactly how I would wrote, you know, move them on that scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you can reject the spectrum altogether, right? Maybe that model is not the right method. That's model my style. <laughs> Good. There you go. Yeah, exactly. I, no, I, I don't reject it. <laughs> Yeah, and, and that's the thing. I, th I think it's interesting. What would this look like as a pyramid, right? That might be a totally different way of arranging these and, and considering them, right? Yeah. Other thoughts? I know, Sean, you wanted to, oh, yes, Kathy. Um, I'm pretty close if I have to do a spectrum to what we're looking on the screen, but Pat's comment on pyramid, I also think we could think of this as a circle, hmm. that there's a surrounding set of values that we're trying to operate in, mm -hmm. which is both when we're dealing with the outside world then the things that we have to do as a council, mm -hmm. that it's not so much inward looking, but this is our responsibility. So, you know, it's within the context of this bigger world, this is who we are. So, so I think that's why we get things in the middle. So some of these things we wanna do it in a transparent way. We wanna be respectful. So 
So I appreciate Pat, you saying it. Do we have to think of it as a line? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you want to ask Shani? Sure. Yeah, I would go back to the infinity then, because to me, and I think there is an assumption that we can do the internal work without the influence of the community. We get a lot. We, you know, we have voted and we represent people in our community. So in that sense, I was like, everything is sort of in the middle or like in that dance, because we bring in a perspective and we get feedback or we already came in with certain ideas from the community, we represent them. So to me, it's really hard to separate what we're doing in this room from the community that we represent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Pat. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting thinking about how might we also lead lead the outward facing community towards some of these values if those are things that matter to us. Yeah, I saw Lynn next. So I I was somewhat like other people, I, although I love the concept of the infinity or circle that Alicia, I mean, uh, Anika and uh, Michelle first brought up, I think, uh, actually Shalini. But I also kept saying, but where's listening? And then maybe I said, okay, listening surrounds the whole thing. And um, so that was just my overall observation. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Anna? I just, a quick, let's make sure we use our mic so Andy can hear us because that's the way he would hear us. So just, yeah, that's all. Got it. Thank you. Um, Dorothy, did you raise a hand? Um, these are awfully quiet. Um, where's action? Hmm. Good. So one thing I'm noticing is I think we're ready to move to my next step in our agenda, actually, which is, um, to now think about these values and how they inform our actual behaviors, right? So values are great, but they're only enforceable by engaging in behavior that then reinforces those values, right? Because that value, that culture happens in the action. It happens in the, um, the behaviors that we engage in with each other. So now what I would invite you to do is take a look at your list of procedures And I think we're gonna focus on the um, page 14 to 15. These are, this is the code of courtesy conduct and debate. Um, and what I would love for you to do, let's go back here. Take a few minutes on your own to read through these. Um, and what we're looking for is sort of what behaviors might reinforce the values that we care most about, especially sort of our inward facing values since this retreat is about how we engage with each other. But you might also think about um, the outward facing. Which rules of procedure map to which values? Do any values not have procedures that map? Um, so it might be thinking about, you know, we say we value, I'm hearing healthy balance is one maybe we haven't turned into a norm. You know, are there no procedures that map to healthy balance? Is that something we want to think about, you know, shifting, right? So that's kind of what you're, the work you're doing right now is doing an inventory, mapping values to procedures, um, and which procedures have been hardest historically for us to transform into norms 
which are the behaviors that we actually engage in. Okay, so let's give this like a, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna put on a timer for five minutes to spend some time with this and then we'll see where we are and if we need even a little bit more time then we can add it, but um, let's start with five minutes of that. Any questions before you launch into that?
Okay, so that was five minutes. Does anyone need a couple more minutes? Raise your hand if it, you could use a couple more minutes to spend some time with us. Okay, I'll, I'll give you two more. Okay, you wanna go ahead and finish jotting down whatever thought you've generated. Um, we're gonna take a break in about 10 minutes, just so you know, just uh, if you're anticipating when is when are we gonna actually have a chance <laughs> to collect ourselves. Um, but before that, we'd love to just sort of um, finish out this conversation on mapping procedures, values, norms, et cetera, um, with just sort of open, open the floor. So there was a set of questions that I prompted you with to get your thinking started. What behaviors um, do we want to reinforce our inward facing values? Which rules of procedure map to which values? Do any not have procedures that map to them? And then also, which have been hardest historically for us to transform into norms? So take this wherever you want to take it, but I would love to hear some voices in terms of what you discovered in looking back through the rules of procedure. Anna. So I think this is it was so helpful to do the inward facing versus outward facing because for me what kept happening was when I looked at my map of or when I thought about because I drew it, my map of the inward versus outward and then I was doing the, the questions. Um, so many of them are really about our inward facing with like a couple focusing on the outward uh, and so there were a lot that I felt did not were not touched by our existing rules of procedure and that's not necessarily to say they have to be but the ones I noticed. Um, some probably should be, uh, fiscal responsibility, environmental sustainability, creativity and innovation, culture and diversity, equity and inclusion were the ones that I felt weren't necessarily touched at all mm -hmm. by our existing rules of procedure, in my opinion. Um, and then the other ones might be an interpretive stretch, but I will leave it there. <laughs> And that's not to say they necessarily have to be, but it is also helpful to just kind of do that inventory to think about, are we actually carrying out the things that, that we care about? Okay, yeah. so it looks like Michelle has a hand raised next. I first wanna acknowledge that um, this exercise has been a little bit challenging for me. It's not exactly the way that I process. So um, I tend to be somewhat non-linear, I guess, um, in the way that I process. So I'm a little slow on the draw here. Um, but, and so I'll just share what sort of is arising for me um, looking at the code of courtesy conduct and debate. Um, the word that comes is containment. Um, and so 
I, I guess I, I sort of invite us to evaluate, like, what is the need for us to sort of contain things? Um, and when I read these, it feels like a lot of containment. And there are reasons why we have to be contained when we're operating as a, a body of legislators. But I invite us to sort of evaluate what those needs are that may be very real. And then also um, think about how we might create more breath, more space, um, so we can still do our work efficiently and effectively, but allow for a more spacious way of looking at these um, these codes. Uh, so that's what I have for right now. Thanks, Michelle. It looks like Andy's next. Yeah, well, um, when I was uh, looking at it, I was finding that and this has been commented on a little bit already. There are some values that are values of what it is. They're community values, really. And, they're, and we are representing a community and trying to um, bring the community together and in in the fashion to achieve have have a government that lives by those values so when we talk about things like diversity and inclusion fiscal uh, responsibility environmental sustainability those are uh, really uh, what we're trying to achieve with the community and for the community um, other values are talking about how we work together in order to achieve those community values and working together sometimes is working with the community and that's a different set of values and that's what's really covered by the rules of procedure so that when you look at the rules of procedure they're going to be much more about things like um, being um, creative and innovative team, teamwork and um, uh, respect. So I guess it's, um, I beginning to divide it up between what it is we seek to achieve and how we achieve it. Thank you. Alicia. Um, so this was also a little bit more complicated for me to approach because I think I first started off by like reading each line and trying to see which value it matched up with and realizing that that wasn't going to work out <laughs> so, so well for me. Mm -hmm. um, and so then I switched to um, coming up with a list kind of like what Anna had in terms of ones that I didn't see that covered anything. And so I had the exact same list with the addition of the healthy balance. Um, that Anna had. So the healthy balance, creativity and innovation, environmental sustainability, fiscal responsibility, culture, and DEI. Um, and then I also did find like certain rules and procedures that not necessarily, like I wouldn't say that they went against what our values are, but they didn't necessarily promote them. Um, and just like a super simple example that I want to give you all, because I don't want to read them all. Um, is 6.3K, the preside, presiding officer and counselor shall address each other by our first names. Um, why? Why don't we just ask each other what we want to be called and make that decision? And so like things like that to me are missing creativity and innovation and healthy balance and transparency and DEI. And so like just tiny little things like that, that can be changed to really more thoroughly encompass what our values are. Thanks, it looks like Dorothy is next. Well, first of all, I'd like to look at the word decorum, uh, which is a word that I have, I don't like. Um, it means ladylike, and it reminds me of being in a tight corset and restricted. Um, so I don't think, I see decorum as being 
a block to uh, true discussion. And I will tell you, I'm feeling still very stupid. It took me three years to learn that when we discuss something, we're only discussing the very limited thing before us, not the issue itself. And um, I, I think that that limits us too much. It puts blinders to keep the real picture, an item from being visible. And it's like talking about a disease, but not talking about the industrial pollution that may have been causing the disease. So I really find these rules like that of a polite debating society and not necessarily appropriate to some of the serious issues that we have to deal with. So, I mean, I obviously agree that we can't have yelling, shouting, we can't have personal attacks. I mean, I understand the motivation behind the code, but I'm thinking that we should, it should be not quite so tight, not quite so restrictive. That's my suggestion. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I, I was actually going to speak to the same point. I hadn't actually wasn't focusing on the word decorum, but that was a good way to explain it. But um, and as Michelle said, I I know there's a reason, you know, for containment and to maintain that we need to be courteous and respectful. Um, that we all agree. But I when I was trying to um, map this to our values, I mean, the only ones I really, you know, I came up with respect teamwork and and i guess maybe transparency uh it, well, i don't know if if the rules apply equally you know as they are meant to to everyone but i i do find them to i know they're meant to contain and to ensure courteous discourse and respectful discourse but they i think when dorothy debate um that it may be too constrained to allow a certain level of debate Thank you, Shani. Yeah, I noticed the containment, just the number of no's, like the counselor shall not do this and not, and there were a lot of like no's and, and, and I understand why we have them, but I think the way to balance is to then have equal number of things that also encourage creativity. And where we do have uh, statements encouraging creativity, like uh, they shall be marked by openness, respect, or, you know, like that creates a safe environment, but we don't actually know what it looks like in action. We have the rule, but there have been times where I know we've had uh, counselors, including myself, being inappropriate or having public being inappropriate. And then the chair is like awkward, like, do I step in? Do I? And the public is awkward. And it's like, just get to, we all had a way of how do we act it out in a way that everyone knows what, you know, what to expect. Like you did, like I may step in if, so you set it up ahead of time so it's not awkward when you do it. Mm -hmm. So having rules that would uh, do that. And then the last thing is we sometimes we have rules, but they're not get, having the desired effect. So if we have uh, diversity and inclusion, like in terms of community and hearing their comments, no matter how long they are going to go. But again, we're not getting all the people in the room. So the rule is there, but it's not being having the desired effect of diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Anika. Yes, yeah, so I had another box that was coming up in my mind. Oh, so I had another box that was coming up for me and I have seen outreach, 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 um, uh, specifically with 61A and 62A, I was also seeing like healthy balance, uh, creative creativity and inclusion, and diversity and inclusion. Um, and also to speak again to Michelle's comment on confinement, um, not only as limiting but also as dangerous. I think that we have a beautiful small town. Um, but it's really important for us to move on, um, especially with diversity. Um, you know, we have on the council now, we're more diverse, we have three women of color. We do not represent every person of color. Um, we have small groups of community members that sometimes are seen to represent the community of color. And this is um, not only untrue, but can be very dangerous. Um, so I think that it's really important for us to um, you really embrace confinement, um, as Michelle said, and outreach. Those are the two that were coming to me for this. 
Thank you. Looks like we've got Lynn, Mandy, and Kathy, and then we're going to take a break after that. So I just want to set that expectation so that we can make sure we have a chance to stretch. Um, so being the person that most often has to apply these rules, <laughs> um, I appreciate them, but I think that I try to not, you know, say that's against the rule. Uh, but my observation is about one of them, which really gets to the fourth question, uh, which procedures have been hardest historically to transform into norms? And it is 66.3J. And that is when a counselor asks in advance of a meeting for questions, data, et cetera, what we've tried to do, but it's not stated in the rules, is make the, all of that information available to all counselors before the meeting so that we do not advantage one counselor with information and disadvantage counselors, other counselors without that information. And that's sometimes hard to do, but I know there's many times that Paul will provide the answer to something and then we, he and I will agree immediately that that answer will go to everybody. So I wanna, I'll probably be sending off something to GOL to add to that rule. Yeah, um, I agree that some of our values don't map to rules. And I think it's because of what Andy said, some of the values are community values. They're not how we run meetings and our rules are mostly for how we get business done. Um, I actually thought some of our rules, looking beyond the one that was highlighted, which is what I did, um, many of our rules do try to, there are some rules that do promote transparency or creativity, um, mostly in, in thanks to Kathy, um, work sessions, public dialogues, and things like that, that she pushed for in the rules. We haven't used them, which is a problem, but, but I think we've attempted to put some of that in there. In terms of the confinement, I don't, I, I don't necessarily agree with the group that they're too confining. Um, and I think it's how we look at meetings and I might look at meetings differently than the group. Um, meetings to me are ways where we need to get business done. And the business is the question in front of us, not necessarily the larger question, which is where we should maybe be using those work sessions a little more, because um, that's where we could go out. We also have to respect state law that is always in conflict with some of what we want to do, particularly that open meeting law, where if we start talking about something that's not on an agenda, we haven't been transparent to the public. And so if what's on the agenda is a small little thing, and we want to talk about a larger portion of it, well, we haven't been transparent to the public if we go to that larger portion. And so it does feel confining, but I think sometimes there's a benefit to that for the public and for us to be able to have an expectation of what we will be discussing and for the public to know what we're discussing. And so they do conflict with each other though, and that is hard. Thanks, Kathy. Mandy, actually, I'll, I'll build on what Mandy just said because um, we did, I was on the group that wrote these rules and there, as we got to the Robert rules, which are these very stringent, what you can and you can't do in the meeting, we put these two entities in, it's 3.8 and 3.9, public dialogue and work session, which I always thought was an opportunity for where teamwork could come in creativity, because we weren't making a decision. We were just talking with each other. And it was an opportunity to have um, what Aaron was talking about is healthy debates. You know, don't think about it the same way, bring in research, bring in information before we're faced with a decision. And they're sitting there to enable that. And I know how busy we were the first three years. So we just hadn't had the opportunity to use them. And then, so I just wanna point those out. And I know Lynn has put that on the agenda for today. And Lynn pointing out that one about get your questions in early to get data. Um, I'm one who often asks for it and is told can't have it before the meeting, <laughs> can't do that. Or ask for it during the meeting and maybe in a committee we'll get it. 
but my question, you know, so it's a frustration because I know we're, we're short staffed that Paul staff can't respond to everything, but it feels then it's inhibiting the creativity and the discourse because we don't have the information we need to be able to even think about things. So I think these are opportunities to do better. I mean, we wrote them in for a reason and we should uh, make use of them. Okay, so we're right on the, the brink of a break, but I do wanna make sure Dorothy gets a chance to get a word in and then we'll, we'll take a quick break. I'll, I'll wrap us up in a moment. So this is just a quick comment to, to Mandy's comment. Um, yes, I see the point and you do have to remind me that the agenda does tell the public what's gonna be discussed. So I would suggest maybe in writing the agenda to make things a little bit broader and not quite so specific so that you allow that possibility, the opportunity for the context of an item to be discussed. Because when we discuss just the item without the context, I don't think we're talking about things. Great. All right, we are not going to solve this question right now, right? But I did wanna give you an opportunity to really do a deep dive into the values that matter to you how those values connect to the behaviors that you engage in with one another. And I think there's room for those things to evolve. And obviously there's all kinds of rules around how these things get adopted or amended or shifted, right? And so that's sort of the work for you all to do moving forward. Um, but I would just remind you that values really only exist if they're reinforced through behavior, right? So I hope that that's a takeaway that you have um, from this is that if we state we have values, but we don't behave accordingly, then we actually don't have those values or we, you know, they don't match with the behaviors that we're engaging in. Um, values can conflict with each other. I think that's some of what's surfacing here that the value of transparency might, you know, conflict with the value of collaboration and teamwork or, you know, innovation or, you know, so, recognizing that we can't always be fully living into every single one of our values 100%, right? We have to negotiate how those things um, show up in different moments. Um, and then the last piece I would leave you with is that rules are only as good as they are mutually reinforced, right? And the more it depends on Lynn as reinforcer, the harder it is to actually engage in those rules. And so thinking about, can we you know, find rules that, we can, that we're all willing to, to live into um, um, because that mutual reinforcement is essentially what makes that behavior become the way that we engage with each other. So some thoughts to think about. Um, why don't we take five minutes? Um, we're close to on time, but a little behind. And so if we could um, do just a quick break to stretch, use the restroom if you need to, get coffee, a drink, et cetera, and then we'll come back. Thank you.
I would love to bring us back if possible. If folks could uh, just one more minute, okay. Okay, I'm going to wrangle you folks, if I can get you to come sit down and get started again. This is fun. That's usually my job. When you get to just eat your cookie and I get to do the work of bringing everybody together, right? <laughs> I know. What's the, what's, who is the who was the baker? Was this a so delicious? I did meet Angela yesterday. Yeah, she's the one that made sure you had a parking pass for today. Nice, wonderful. Okay. There are no gavels or anything in this. Uh, no. Oh, you have a gavel. Oh, I don't need a gavel. <laughs> it's okay. There we go. A local Beautiful. I don't have the there. Uh, uh, Athena. Athena is the keeper keeper of the Mary Maple. Oh wow. Oh, that's cool. That's great. She was from the. Okay, uh, let's come. Area. Let's get started again. So, you know, half of the work is doing this formal engagement, but half of it also is having a chance to connect with each other. So I hope you did get a chance to check in with folks. It is really nice to see people in person. So um, I'm glad you're able to do that. All right. So we spent the first half of this, well, half-ish of this retreat session, looking at values, norms, our behaviors with each other. Um, I now want to shift to thinking about the work that is ahead of you um, and engaging in some reflection on priorities and also then thinking about process for tackling those priorities or pursuing those priorities together as a council. So before you came to this session, you uh, completed a pre-retreat survey to express kind of what most mattered to you, what were the priorities that you um, had as an individual. And so I wanna take some time to dig into those. You may have seen them already, but I think taking a, a little bit of time to really look at them is worth doing. Um, and again, we're gonna do some individual reflection and then conversation. And these are the prompts that you're thinking about as you're looking through those. The first is just a general, what do you notice? You know, now that you have the map of what the priorities are for all the different counselors here, um, what, do you, what do you notice in terms of overlaps, differences, et cetera? The second question is, where do you imagine there will be the highest level of energy and attention for this council? So where do you see a lot of energy and heat kind of co coalescing? Where do you imagine we will have the easiest time aligning around shared solutions? 
And where do you imagine we will have the greatest challenge aligning around shared solutions? And I'm gonna say right now, I wanna ask you not to share what you think the solutions should be right now. This is not a moment to like argue for your point of view on parking. Um, it is a moment for you to share your point of view about why parking might be challenging for this council to come to alignment around, okay? Those are two very different questions. And like I said earlier, this is where the weeds are gonna come in, right? And it's very natural for that to happen, but my job is to say, okay, let's come out and think about why might this be challenging for us, okay? So again, I'm gonna set a timer for five minutes. I'll check in with you then. We'll see if you need a little bit more time. These are a lot of big questions, right? So you might wanna jot down some thoughts and notes, um, but I'll check back in with you in five minutes. So there was a question, are we looking at the pre-retreat council priorities? Are we looking at the work session priorities, constituent concerns, or all of the above? And I would say, let's start by focusing on the pre-retreat, but then use the other two documents as sort of reference. Is that fair? Okay. Definitely focus on the pre-retreat priorities. Thank you.
that was five minutes, but I see people are still deep in the work. So I'm gonna give it a couple more and then see where we are then. Let's go another 30 seconds. like Lynn has a hand raised to kick off the conversation. Right. So I wanted to just mention a few things about the analysis. Okay. I'm the one that chose to put them grouped based on the town manager's goals, because I feel like if we have a priority that is outside the town manager's goals, we need to make sure we identify that. Okay. If you do not agree with how I have classified your priority, because I had to do some force fitting, please let me know that in an email and I'll be glad to make a change, but not today, okay? And then the other thing is I've taken this analysis to the level that the data allows. Um, you can't do averaging, you can't do anything else besides basic counts, okay? So thank you. Thanks, Lynn. All right, I'm curious, what do you notice? Um, and feel free to tackle any one of these questions that appeals to you, but it might be interesting just to first of all, kind of reflect um, with one another about what, what we see here. Do you wanna take your hand down? Okay, great. Kathy. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So one of the things I noticed um, was an absence um, of 
top ratings of things like the school. And, and the reason I noticed it is an absent is it's going to come before us in our term. It's going to be controversial and we'll have to make a decision about it. So, um, so it, that's just what I noticed on it. The other thing I noticed is um, similarly, if I get down to, I'm on the finance committee. <laughs> if I get down to how much money do we have in over the next two years, unless the Biden infrastructure bill passes and got, or someone else gives us a lot, there's conflicting priorities. Um, we've got big capital projects. We have other spending and we probably can't afford all of them. So the, um, what I noticed is not everyone picked how difficult it's gonna be able to make those decisions. So it, it's sort of a, we, various of us picked things that are expensive. Mm -hmm. And when you add them up, it's probably more than we can afford. Thank you. Other observations, things that you notice are emerging. Jennifer. Well, housing by far. <laughs> Um, had the highest number. Uh, and I'll send an email to Lynn, but I feel like I have to say, my concern isn't preserving single family homes, it's just to be able to have homes, rentals, and otherwise be affordable to non-students renting by the bedroom, but I'll clarify that in an email. But I, I was just struck by that, that that by far had the greatest number of uh, votes, so to speak. Great, okay, so energy attention around housing. Yep. Mandy. Um, just on the notice part, I noticed that we set a lot of goals for the managers that we then have no care about at all on our priority in some sense. Um, <laughs> and some of that could be that we as a council don't have any role in that. And so it isn't a council priority, but I, I thought it was fascinating that there's a lot of manager goals that we didn't identify as also any any item of that as a priority of ours. Many of them were in the administrative side where we don't have duties, but there were some policy goals that we didn't really have as a council, um, a lot of say of our own priorities there. Thanks, Shawnee. Yeah, I noticed that my priorities were the least popular. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that being said, uh, I think what I noticed was that where there's a lot of investment of town time and, and money mainly is like was a priority, uh, but at the same time, again, I see that how we raise the funds and the economic policy, and as Nandi said, maybe that's not our job, but that was one of my questions is figuring out as a town council, what can we be thinking about and to support and create a clear vision for our economic goals as a town uh, in a sustainable, socially just way. So that to me was really important. And, I was the only one in that. And, uh, but I think the key thing for me again is that we, whatever we choose as a priority, what are the processes in place to ensure that we have a process of decision-making where we are really cre creatively thinking about it. It's inclusive, it's bringing in people who are being impacted, whether we like it or not, you know. We have to bring in, how do we bring in those people into the conversation and to really get creative around it. So I would really like that to be a foundation, to have a shared foundation for that. Great, thank you. And we're gonna spend some time, the next thing on our agenda is to start thinking about process. So yes, um, <laughs> you're like the only person I know who's like, yes, process, woo! Oh, sorry, Anna loves process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I also love process. Um, other observations or, or things that are surfacing for you as you, you take a look at this? Anna. You said me? Okay. I think it, it's interesting, um, Kathy, when you were talking about the elementary school, one of the things I noticed is that the areas that were feeling to me like we'd have the easiest, and easiest is very much a relative term. It doesn't mean an easy time, but easiest they were the ones where our decision is pretty singular, right? So like the elementary school is a good example of, we don't get to decide a lot of the things you do, you two do in, in your committee, That's which is awesome, which is why you're there. But uh, we as a council, what comes before us is really one question, one-ish questions, right? And so 
I thought that would be the easiest. The places where our scope is more limited felt like the easier places for us to come to alignment. Um, and so that was my, my I'm, I don't usually cheat the questions, but I am cheating a little bit. Of uh, that's That was my notice and a little bit of bullet three. Thanks, Lynn. So another observation I had was I think some people might not have said this is a priority because they already assumed it was, and that would be the capital projects, okay? Uh, or finance or something like that. And the other thing is that some of you are gonna look at this and say, oh, but that's a priority of mine too. So there's a whole piece of this that we still have to sort through. This is a preliminary stab. Having said that, um, I think I'm gonna just jump to the one where I think the greatest challenge is gonna exist and that's finance. Because everybody wants a piece of the pie and the pie is just so big. <laughs> Thanks, Dorothy. I won't point to the specific numbers, but um, some issues are divided up and presented in two places. And one of them is sidewalks. So on the issue, what do your constituents bring up to you all the time? And uh, there's, there's sidewalks and bike paths and there's sidewalks and they should really all be together. It's sidewalks and that's what they bring up all the time. So it kind of got, sidewalks got a little diluted there, although it's still quite obvious, but um, that may not be the glorious topic that many people want to run on, but that's what our constituents keep bringing up. That's nice to be able to balance those, right? The constituents concerns with our priorities, given that we are inward facing and outward facing, right? That's a, a common theme here. Um, Andy. Sorry, it took me a moment. Um, I think one of the things that I noticed was the number of people who put parking down which is really in your sort of parking uh, in your introductory comments. You know, I think that parking is uh, an issue that keep people keep coming back to because it really um, it, it it needs to be put into focus of what it's really about, and uh, it, it is something that we're going to have to deal with. But I think that the question is, um, what is the, wh why are so many people concerned about what seems like um, the least of issues? And I think, you know, for me, it has to do with the connection between um, economic development budget and choices that uh, we really need to do it. I think that other people have other reasons. And, uh, but yeah, I said, what did I notice? That was uh, one of the things I noticed. Lynn, yeah. Yeah, I just need to acknowledge that soon to be Grandma Pam has joined <laughs> us. <laughs> Please let the record show that she is with us. Unless, unless Pam, you have an announcement to make. She just muted. I guess that means. Um, no. Sorry, I just um, I have no announcement to make, but thank you for your attention and your concern. Appreciate <laughs> it. Welcome, welcome, <laughs> Alicia. Yeah. Um, so just a quick observation, um, because I do very much agree with what Lynn said in terms of there are a lot of things on here that are important to me and that I think are priorities, but I didn't give them a number. Um, so I just want to recognize that and that I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, but that if you look really carefully at what people chose, it does say something about them personally, like, you know, me and Kathy put the elementary school building um, as a priority because we're on the elementary school building committee. And so like things like that. And then, you know, it's very interesting that district three parking was very important to both of them. So, you know, just things like that. This is a, a very telling list. And then I also just agree with Lynn in that I think the most difficult things that we will face are like any topic that has a budget implication. I think those are all going to be things that are gonna be challenging for us um, to come to agreements on. And I think that was all I wanted to share. 
Thanks, Jennifer. I just went, went, I remember tuning into, I think a council meeting when I was not a counselor last year and Lynn said something which is so true. He said, I think in all your time in public service, nothing is more contentious than taxes and zoning. <laughs> and I think we'll find that too. <laughs> and taxes in terms of you know, finance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Thank you. Um, I looked at this very uh, simplistically in, in some ways. And what I realized is even though there's contention right now about a temporary solar moratorium, there isn't contention about the need for a solar bylaw. So I actually think that that's one of the things that's gonna be easiest for this council to deal with. Um, I see us having a much more difficult time about parking, uh, which says something. <laughs> and I also think that uh, in terms of racial equity and social justice issues, that we're gonna have a hard time when it comes down to it. And to pretend that we're not uh, is, is a mistake because we need to be prepared for the kinds of responses um, that will be generated on so many levels. And we need to find ways to support the people who are most affected by our decisions. Um, and not see that as a constraint that's unfair or something. Uh, that's kind of where I, what I've been thinking about. Thanks, Pat. Mandy. Yeah, um, you know, I think the highest level of energy I found what I was looking at didn't always align with what I thought might be the easiest or hardest shared solutions. Um, you know, many of them did, but um, I actually disagree with Pat on whether a solar siting bylaw will be, I think it'll be one of our hardest times aligning because I think the discussion of the moratorium shows the different priorities on what a solar siting bylaw might look like. And so I actually think that will be a difficult conversation. Um, I actually think parking and housing affordability will also be two difficult conversations. Um, I'm hoping that design guidelines, I actually put that as one of the easiest time aligning. And I think, I could be proven wrong on that, but maybe that's just my hope that when we get to a consultant with actual design guidelines that we might be able to align on the guidelines, which I hope are different than where things are built type thing. <laughs> and so, you know, and it's been an interesting hearing the challenge, everyone put finance as um, hardest time aligning. Um, I put it might be an easier thing to align. That doesn't mean the conversations are easy, but we might be able to get to shared solutions. So I'm hopeful we'll be able to get to shared solutions easier than some other things. Thanks, looks like Dorothy is next. Well, I think some, some things seem easy until you put the dollar sign to them. So the social justice, uh, to me, that's an easy topic. But when you say, and we want money for a youth center, then that's the difficult topic because right now we're all fighting for the money and the capital projects are taking all of it as far as I can see. So it's, I, I see big problems and we're gonna be fighting about money because we can believe and agree on ideas and concepts, but then you say, okay, let's put it into practice. And if that costs money and we don't have the money lying around, then we have a problem. So I do see some problems about things we agree on coming down to money. Thanks, Kathy. I just want to um, come back to a statement Mandy made on easier being the school. I think we're facing a controversial price tag for it that maybe we'll be able to solve before it comes to the council. Um, you just have two of us on it, but the decision we have to make, which is unlike the library, we have to go out to the voters to ask them to raise their taxes to pay for it. So that I put it under hard. Um, yes, it's just one decision, but this is not, we, we are gonna have to be thinking about it, justifying it. And so to the extent any of you can follow what's going on now, it's important. So I just think of those are when Dorothy said it's the dollar signs, you know, we 
when I said the library was easier, we had the internal money to do it. So it was a question of, do you want this version or that version? But um, this one is harder because we have to talk to the whole town. One of the things that I'm hearing surface here is that there are different definitions about easy and hard, right? So easy, it, we might find it easy to align on, we all care about this, or we all want this solution, but weighing it against other solutions that we, or other priorities that we have, right? That That is something to kind of be thinking about here. And so that I think that's a helpful framing to say, yes, this part of it's easy, that part of it's actually really challenging. So um, it looks like Shalini's next. Yeah, I was actually going to talk about that. We are using the word difficult conversations, and and that's primarily because uh, one of we don't have a framework how we're going to approach it, um, and and how do we transform these different perspectives and different points of view, which make a conversation different difficult sometimes, is because we don't have the process to trans use that diversity of perspective into better solutions because now we're actually seeing things from all the, you know, that's actually a strength and not, should not be a difficult, difficulty. Uh, and then the other thing is like, just what makes it difficult for me personally is when we're leading with solutions that this is what we should do versus again, coming back to process that if we had a framework of what are our intentions, values, and what already exists, what are resources, what's possible. So again, but we're gonna talk about that. But to me, I don't see difficult as a bad thing necessarily. Mm -hmm. Any additional thoughts on these questions? I mean, one of the things that I would add is that um, I think about this every year when I get to kind of goal setting for myself is that too many priorities is actually no priorities, right? So if I make a set of goals for myself that includes, you know, 20 items, then I'm actually not prioritizing. I'm giving myself a, a free pass to just sort of not prioritize any of those things. And so that's some of the hard work is narrowing to say, we do care about all of these things. And yet in order to be our most effective selves or, and group, we actually have to align on which ones are we going to put most of our time and focus on, right? And that is not, when we first planned this retreat, we hoped we could maybe even do some of that narrowing. And then I, you know, in talking about it, we realized like, this is not the moment. It's just too much, it takes too much time to kind of do that. That's the work ahead of you all, right? Um, but really starting to think about and mapping, what are the, the options for us? How do, how do we get to a place where we can come together around that, I think is, is part of what is ahead of you. So it looks like Andy has a hand. Yeah, and I was actually going to say pretty much the same thing, so I'll be real brief with it. What I had written down is for the, for the fourth category, where do you match? We will have the greatest challenge for lining around shared solutions. I wrote down this, where we have to recognize we cannot do something of high value. Mm -hmm. Great. Shalini, is that a hand again? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I don't know if this is the right time to ask, but do we have a set of criteria for prioritizing? Like, is it, who is this impact, this decision going to impact? Like when you decide whether it's parking or social justice or climate, I mean, I think we've, I don't know if you have a shared set of criteria we're using, who is this going to impact? How is it going to impact them? Is it around safety and you know, and then going into how does it help everyone flourish? So just having a shared set of criteria to even prioritize. Great, Anna. I think the other part of it is also trusting in one another to carry some of, not carry, that's not the right word, but to, to advocate for some of these too, right? Like we cannot, if we all have all of these as priorities, we're not gonna, like you said, we're not gonna get them done. And so, you know, I see that Shalini put economic development. I care a lot about economic development and I know that Shalini is going to champion it and I'll support her. But by the time all that pre-work is done and it comes to council, I'm not going to try to go back to square one, right? And so like, it's also about doing that pre-work, looking at this list and saying, great, I know that, you know, um, other folks are like, Dorothy is into sidewalks and I'm into bike lanes, which, you know, that that's something that we might want to approach together so that we can do the pre-work together and by the time we come to council, we're not getting questions that take us all the way back to the beginning, right? There needs to be that level of trust and, and 
when we get to process next, thinking about making sure we're asking for thoughts and soliciting opinion on the onset of it versus waiting till we get to council and people see it for the first time. That's not helpful. That's not a helpful place to then start over, right? So how do we make sure we're trusting one another and building that process to advocate at the start? Another thing I would add, building on that, Anna, is that um, when you're arriving at priorities, sometimes you can get stuck. Groups can get stuck when what they're doing is deciding on do we do bike lanes or not, right? That's a solution that you're arguing about. But if you can actually step back from bike lanes and ask the question, like, what problem are we trying to solve with bike lanes? And is that allowing a sustainable way for, for residents to get from point A to point B, then we can maybe come together around sidewalks and bike lanes and who knows what other creative possibilities, right? And so thinking about the like, what is the actual problem we're solving? And then can we align around common ways to get there um, as opposed to getting down to into, like I said, in the weeds of like, it's either bike lanes or no bike lanes and we all have to decide which side of that fence we're on, right? Um, and so setting priorities can also be about setting some like beautiful, how might we questions around the kinds of pro um, problems that you're trying to solve together and, and tackling those together that are really aligned, you know, you can align around values even if you have different kinds of solutions or ways of thinking about solutions for those problems. So um, something to think about there. John, you have that hand raised again? Oh, okay, wasn't sure. Okay, so let's start thinking about process and what process could look like. Um, what I would love for us to do, oops, that's not where the break goes, I'm going backwards. Okay, so I'd love to take a moment to think about process. And when you're designing a process, you might think of it almost like a recipe. I'm a very big baker, I love to bake. And so if you think about baking, it has a set of ingredients and those ingredients kind of go in in some order, right? And so there is a process to baking. You, you know, have a start to finish experience. and so. Um, I would love for you to just take a moment on your own to brainstorm what are some of the steps that if we're going to pursue one of these priority areas, we should engage in, and you don't have to put them in order, you're just sort of brainstorming some things that you think we need to do as part of that process. So take a couple minutes to do some individual brainstorming.
So take just one more minute to gather your thoughts on what the steps are for you. Okay, so I did some brainstorming myself before I came to the retreat and I'm curious if the things you say are gonna map to what I have up here. And if not, I'm gonna add new sticky notes and maybe take off ones that, that feel like they don't resonate with you, okay? So would love to have people share out. Don't even worry about what's up there, but it will help me have a sense of whether I got these right um, according to the steps that you have uh, generated. Um, and it looks like uh, Dorothy has a hand raised. Well, I did it very differently. <clears throat> I'm a baker. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe in using the best ingredients and making the absolutely best cookies because when you're finished, you're gonna share them with people. And if you make really great cookies, there's a feeling of shared joy. So that, that means that the ingredients have to be good, the best ones, um, that the timing really matters, that you have to figure out what you can fix and put together and put aside and leave to another time and then when you do start working, how do you handle them? What kind of tools and how difficult? And is it gonna be a blended egg or is it gonna be a meringue? And then it has to be the proper container, the right size, and the heat has to be right. And the main thing is that you have to stay there. You have to watch it. You have to smell it. You have to test it. You never neglect it. You don't ever turn your eyes from it. And when you're done, you have something wonderful. Um, so I'm thinking of the school right now. The latest report on the elementary school sounds like it's gonna be some really beautiful brownies. And there's gonna be a problem because people say it's too many feet, it's too many this. But the point is, are you gonna build a great school? And if you are, then do it so that we don't have just a good enough school, we have a great school. So that's not the way a lot of people do things, but this is how I think it makes you happy in your work. If you're gonna make it, make it and do it right. Thanks, Dorothy. Pam. Hi. Um, I, I am thinking about a process I would, I would probably, I'm not going to use a baking analogy, um, issues that we've experienced. What are, what, what, what's on the table that we're trying to solve? What are the problems? And I typically start by generating data, by um, understanding and getting my head into the details of it to understand what the parts and the components are, um, I look at then potential arenas for input, like who, who controls this information, who controls this part of the puzzle, um, and start communicating with them, getting information, additional information, which ultimately starts to craft potential solutions. And then this, the, the piecing together the, the potential solutions in a way that um, involves the folks that have uh, that have contributed the information and contributed to um, to some of the solutions, uh, and then and then um, 
obviously having to reach out to others who might have a similar interest, uh, for instance, on the council in explaining or getting them on board to help support uh, the, the outcome. Thanks. So as I'm listening to you all share, I'm adding where I think we haven't already um, represented a, a piece. And uh, if, if it feels like I didn't adequately get yours, you can raise your hand again and I can make sure that I get it up there. Um, but Pam, I heard identify other counselors who share this priority. Um, and I also heard uh, determine whose voices haven't been heard on the issue and include them among key stakeholders. Um, and then I added generate and analyze data uh, and consider who controls the information or other pieces of the puzzle. Um, Dorothy, your hand is raised. Is that still, is that from the last time? Okay, great. It looks like I've got Mandy's hand next. Yeah, I actually looked at this project or this question as two separate questions. One on how we would pursue deciding our priorities and one on once we did make that decision, how do you then move forward with those particular priorities. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how we would pursue the priorities or figuring out as a council, which ones of this extensive list we came up with are the priorities we need to pursue. Um, and so I thought we'd need to identify the problems to solve that's been said earlier, that then we have to identify which problems are most important to us, but we also have to identify which problems can be addressed within our terms and what the capacity of us, the staff and all of that are to address certain priorities. Like if they're all in one staffing area, well, that might not work um, because they might not have the capacity to do all of them. And then we have to mesh those together to come up with top three, top five, whatever that is. And that might be more priorities than we think if they fall within different staffing levels or um, different, it, is the council pursuing it and doing the work or is the staff doing the work or is a committee doing the work? And if you figure that out, you might be able to identify more priorities. So uh, I'll stop there with how we get down to three, four, five priorities before we move on to how do we make the, those priorities a reality then? Great, so I'm sort of clustering down here. This is a kind of decide which priorities to pursue in the first place and determine what is possible for us. Does that adequately represent what you what you shared? Thank you. Great, Kathy. I don't think I'm really adding to your sticky notes. I think they're great sticky notes, but that consider multiple possible solutions. I'd move over a little bit. Um, because that's where there's an opportunity for discussion and debate. And uh, in the world I used to live in, they said, Dorothy wanted the perfect and the best cake, but in healthcare, we sometimes had to take steps um, and it was a resource issue. So is there a partial step? So the one thing I don't think of here is here, is do we have the resources to do it? You know, either, you know, it's just change a rule, that's easy. It's spend a lot of money. So maybe it's not a research. So I'll give the example on housing. We have a lot of priorities around housing, but some of those, it's not clear, it's within the council's power to make certain things happen. <laughs> you know, so it's just trying to figure out the constraints on our ability to make change. Great, thank you. And one thing I should note, I forgot to say, this is not in any order. These are all randomly here because actually our next step is gonna be figuring out an order for these steps. Um, but for now, what we're doing is just putting on the table, what are all the ingredients going into this cake in the first place, right? Um, it looks like Anna's next. Okay, so uh, Mandy mentioned the two different questions. I wanna be clear, I'm talking about the latter of her two. So like once we know what we wanna do, how do we do it? Um, and there's a couple and I'm trying to glance and glance. So I apologize if I missed some. Um, ask ourselves who is impacted and who's not represented at the table. So considering kind of whose, whose voices are we missing in discussions, uh, get feedback from supporters, get feedback from naysayers anticipated, right? So, and that feeds, I think, to what Kathy is saying is to then gain ideas for multiple solutions or, or kind of um, collaborative solutions. Um, consult Mass General Law and our bylaws just to make sure we're not proposing something that's blatantly against what we're supposed to be doing or allowed to do. Uh, benchmark with similar communities. 
conduct resident engagement. I know that's a whole broad thing. And then reach out, uh, you kind of have this, you have stakeholders. I think there's stakeholders, but also even more specifically uh, applicable resident committees. Sorry, Anna, you, uh, Anna, you talked, I know your name. Why did I just call you Anna? Um, Anna <laughs> you just talked really fast. What was Sorry. the- I got him, I got him, I got him. Okay, so resident engagement, which means 20 different things. Mm -hmm. Reach out to applicable committees. Um, you have stakeholders on there, which is great, but I, I think even specifically our, our resident committees. Um, benchmark with similar communities. That's the one I missed, okay. thank you. All right, does it, do a, Do you feel like I adequately captured? I have one more, I think I forgot to okay. say, um, which is ask the question of how this supports our values. I get to do that fun thing where you type in front of a whole crowd. Make sure I don't <laughs> have any typos, there we go, okay. Okay, and there's no rhyme or reason to the color coding. I just think it's nicer when it's multiple colors. So just FYI, there's no, there's no coding going on here. Um, okay, Lynn. Yeah, this builds on something I think Mandy said, but I wanna make it much more clear. What is the council's role in this issue? And to make sure very upfront, we're looking at, is it to change a bylaw? Is it to create a bylaw? Is it to do what? Thank you. Alicia. Um, I don't have anything very different than what everyone has already said, um, but just um, something that I like to call impact mapping which is not only looking at what Kathy said in terms of like our ability to make it happen, but then also looking at like different community outcomes and impacts on the ground. Does that look okay? Okay. Okay, Jennifer, it looks like you have a hand next. Um, yeah, I think, so I was, I was struck by that housing and I guess major capital projects um, seem to have the greatest number of counselors had put those as priorities. And maybe this gets to a working session, but I think on both of those and even housing, you know, which there's a lot, it, it, it's a seemingly um, issue that arouses a lot of passions, but I have a feeling we're not that far off from each other in our goals. I think some of the strategies to get there may be different, you know, and um, when Alicia says, you know, what are the impacts on the ground? You know, that's where I think we may have, you know, there may be some differences of opinion, but I, I think there, like that issue just really strikes me as one that if we could have a, start with a couple of just free flowing conversations, I think we would find that we're not really that far off from each other. And then, um, you know, what as counselors, what what can we do, and what are the steps we can take to improve housing, which we all agree needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you may find process will look slightly different for different issues, right? Because the issues have all kinds of different, you know, contexts, et cetera. Um, so I think that's a good point to to bring up that it's not always going to be, you know, look exactly the same. Um, Alicia, you have a hand raised. That, that's okay. No worries. Um, Anika. Yeah, so I agree. Those are all great uh, notes. Um, one that I have, which is probably up here in a way, but is also um, anticipate um, the or leave room rather for the unexpected and hmm. new decisions, information that comes up. Um, you know, myself, I had had for my number one was um, uh, affordable housing and uh, economic opportunity. And um, one thing in housing, I agree, we're probably closer to being on the same page, but, you know, sometimes there's a kind of consensus that, for instance, like students have disposable income, all of them do, without, you know, acknowledging that some, that's just really not the case for a lot. And we do have the very real issue of homelessness 
within students. So I think just making sure that we, you know, we're truly being inclusive of, you know, what those needs are and the impact and effects. Great. I, I have it written as anticipate the unexpected. Does that uh, capture it or is there more language you want to add? Okay, that's great. Okay. Shalini. Just building off of um, looking at impacts and stakeholders, I think uh, specifying that we're looking at people's lived experiences. I mean, generally we're going to do people want this or don't want this. Like, do you want the moratorium or you don't want it? Or do you want this housing or you don't want it? Versus like, like what you were saying, understanding the problem that we're solving. And so uh, when we're looking at stakeholder engagement, it's really looking at um, what are their lived experiences? How is it impacting the quality of their lives? You know, and, and so approaching the engagement in a way that we really understand people's um, challenges and in, in quality of life. And then also looking in terms of other stakeholders, like the practical aspect, like we have a lot of ideological values and ideas, um, but we sometimes don't consider what are the practical obstacles in achieving those things. And so which means we need to be speaking to a, very, a wider spectrum of people who can tell us how to uh, implement. So not just experts in the sense of scholarly and academic and research, but also practical. Um, yeah, those are two things that. Got it. And do you, do you see those represented here or should we include new sticky notes for those points, do you think? Yeah, they're more a subset of stakeholder engagement. Okay. Consult key stakeholders. Yeah, it's just a, a finer point within that. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Um, so kind of keeping in mind as consult consulting key stakeholders, maybe it's sort of lived experiences and practicalities. Thank you. Uh, Anika, you've got a hand and Shalini, I'm assuming those were the past ones. Okay, just making sure. Mandy. Yeah, um, I could be missing it here, but capacity, there's, there's very different capacities. The capacity of us as town counselors to manage all of the priorities and all of the meetings that go with the priorities, any of the outreach and all of that, that we can't overload ourselves. The capacity of staff, if we're gonna be expecting staff to do stuff. And frankly, the capacity of the community too, for all of those meetings too. You know, if, I, I think it goes to what is everyone's capacity and managing that and recognizing that we might have priorities that we just can't get to because there's not capacity. Great, thank you. Lynn. This, this may go with impact, but once we decide to move forward on something, we need to look at the cost of implementation and the impact of implementing that on whoever is in charge of doing that. And frankly, assess whether or not that's doable or um, it's going to create a negative impact, for instance, on the people who might respond to an RFP or that kind of thing. Thank you. Does, does, uh, I've got determine the likely cost of proposed solutions and necessary resources. Does that capture that for you or do you think we should add something? Um, I think that's fine. Okay. Shalini? Do we have a measurement of once we do implement something and how successful, how do we measure success? What would success look like? Okay. Dorothy. I, I don't think that we can do anything with like a chart with numbers. I mean, it's really just figuring out what you're going to do. For example, thinking of the school, I think I saw a headline, a sentence today saying that Fort River ground is better for digging uh, geothermal. You know, and I didn't read the details. 
So it could turn out that you've decided that the new school should be at, a, at one place for lots of good reasons. And then you find out that your energy saving is better at the other place. And you have to sit there and rethink it and weigh it and balance it. I mean, it's, it's, I don't think that we can do things with numbers and charts and weighing. I think it's got to come down to just making decisions and choices. And they could have been made, you know, different ways. Um, but sometime you're going to make a decision. Um, so like if, if, if it were up to me, I'd say, oh, I'm going to go with geothermal because that is cheaper in the long run. But others would say, no, there's so many different reasons. There, it's really difficult. It's really challenging. And I don't think there's any way that we can really put this into a neat thing. I think it's good to know the things that consider. It's good to know to think about, oh yeah, what's this going to do to staff? What's this going to do to the money? All of those things. But when it comes down to it, decisions have to be made and they're going to be made by a weighing and balancing process that we're going to either fight against or accept. And that's the challenge, you know. Thanks, Pat. Uh, yeah, I'm building a little bit on what Anika said uh, about leaving room for the unexpected. I think one of the things that I don't see us doing, but I think is important in terms of process is finding and expressing agreement where we agree or where we're connected, but also finding and expressing the differences and then sitting with that tension um, to get to something we didn't expect. And I don't know if culturally in the council or elsewhere, we have the patience to do that, um, to not just say, this is my position, instead of this is where I am, this is where you are, what's in between and where, I don't know. Thank you, Lynn. Decision to give it up. Walk away, you can't do this one. <laughs> Just decide whether to keep going. Is it <laughs> okay? Let's make that one pink. All right. Um... Okay. So we have a lot here, which is great. And you might find that some of these feel connected to each other. You might feel some of them don't. You might personally feel like some of these are not as necessary than others. And so what I want you to do right now is just take a minute to start organizing some of these things into like a flow chart that makes sense to you. So how, what, what's the order of operations for some of this? If you're imagining uh, the, the work of pursuing an issue, are there pieces here that go with other pieces that kind of fit in a bucket? So start doing some of your own kind of thinking about the how the pieces fit together. And I'm going to do my best to make these as big as possible so that you can see the text of them, not because any of them are more important than other ones.
I just want to do a check in with folks. Does two to three more minutes seem appropriate? Okay, so one of the beautiful things about working with other people is that they design process completely differently than you do, right? And that's what actually really challenging, but if you lean into that being okay and ex accepting that your way of approaching process is not always the right one, you can actually arrive at some really interesting outcomes. So I just use that to start us off, um, but would love to hear how some folks have designed process um, when looking at all these different pieces. And it looks like uh, Pam has a hand raised. And so we'll start there. Great, I was gonna start what I perceived as one of the easiest parts and that's the beginning. Um, deciding on which, uh, and, and these are like four items that cluster at the beginning, I think. Decide on which priorities to, to pursue. Um, determine what the council's role is in the issue, um, ask the question of how this supports our values, and reflect on why it matters to us and our constituents. So that's kind of the core of what feels to me the starting point of grappling with, you know, what, what project are we talking about? Awesome. So I put that down in this bottom corner for now. We can move it around if we need to, but I'm just sort of starting to pull together some buckets here. Um, it's it's a little bulky on this page. I wish I had like a big yeah. giant board, but um, but thank yeah. you. Great, Dorothy. Starting the same way. Uh, why this matters, how it supports our values, what is the council's role. When is it going to happen? And then the how. And then the resources in terms of money, staff, information, stakeholders. What's already been done? Is this legal? Um, what are the impacts? Um, and at that point, you really put together your proposal, your solution, or your legislation, and you then line up your supporters and advocates and feedback. And what's been interesting for me in doing this is that this is not usually how I think. Um, I get very annoyed, for example, using the school. Why can't they just decide whether they're gonna do one school or two schools and which place it's gonna be? But I see now this is the process that they followed. Um, so I did learn something from that. And also I have to write a bylaw, which I've been putting off. And I thought, okay, now I really know the order to do it. It's a very small little one on gas fueled leaf blowers that somebody's been asking me to do forever. So um, thank you for making me think this through. Absolutely, yeah. And I would say that making process transparent can be part of transparency 
as your value as a council too. So that when, when you have community members who come to you with impatience, to say, why hasn't this been decided yet? You can do the same thing to say, here's a map of how we've gone through this carefully so that that becomes as clear as possible to folks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Alicia. Uh, so I found a similar thing to Dorothy and that this was really helpful for me because I don't usually think about it in this way. And I also sometimes jump from place to place when I'm trying to approach something. So this was a very much more linear way of me thinking about it and so what I the approach that I took is I had different steps and I grouped all of these things into different steps and so I had like step one would be the planning portion and that would be like deciding on the priorities determining what the council's role is reflecting on the why learning um, what has already been accomplished understanding the horizon for the issue and then I had <clears throat> step two which would be gathering and analyzing the data and that yeah. would be you know, like doing the outreach, the stakeholders, all of those things, and then possible solutions, considering all of the multiple solutions, looking at what other communities are doing, and then the possible outcomes. So mapping out what those impacts to all of the possible solutions are so that you can decide which one would be your best. So that's about as far as I got, but I sort of grouped, I had multiple sticky notes from here in each group of the process. Great, yeah, so what you're starting to do is cluster these into phases almost and thinking about what are the sub pieces within each phase, right? Mm -hmm. um, and maybe during our lunch break, one of the things I can do is create another slide that clarifies some of those phases for us that we can kind of look at on the other side of the, of the break. Thanks, Alicia. Lynn. I think um, looking at what can be done in our term. So let me, as an example, building a new school is about a six or seven year process. Our terms are only two years long. So in our first term, we voted to support submitting for the MSBA proposal and we put some money out. This term, we will have to decide whether to go out for a debt exclusion override and hopefully at some point authorize uh, borrowing. And then actually our role is done except to show up for the ribbon cutting. Um, so. I'm sorry, and the groundbreaking, excuse me, the groundbreaking, the beam and the ribbon cutting. Thank you. Um, do you all so, have big scissors? Is that part of oh, the game? Oh, we do, oh, wow. we do. Okay. I gotta come right. Amazing. But, but I also wanna go back to one that Mandy Joe and several other counselors have worked very hard on and that's zoning. So they got certain things done in zoning, but because of finances, we couldn't do the design part until this term. But now that has come up because it's in the budget. So it's not a, we can get it all done in this term and we need to respect the fact that there are periods sometimes which we have control over and sometimes which we have no control over. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, as you're talking, it's reminding me that you all are collaborating on so many different levels. You're collaborating with each other. You're collaborating with your community, but you're also collaborating temporally with other councils, right? Because the work is never done. It's it's never like we've we've solved Amherst, right? That just isn't a thing. And so for forever it will be there to work on, right? Which in some for some people might feel really frustrating, but it's also like a healthy reminder that there, you are you're collaborating with future versions of you and past, you know, folks who it, are, you know, delivered these problems to you. Um, and so to keep that in mind it might offer some perspective. Um, Shalini. Um, I would add to the first step uh, of the problem statement and what we care about. I would add to that, you know, looking at what are the risks, unintended consequences of doing things and not doing them. And, um, and then looking at across community, like who is it impacting? Um, and then the second step was, so the first was a problem statement. The second was what do we know about this? And that includes all the generating the data and then looking at the community engagement, people's lived experiences, the technical aspects of things, the social cultural variables, all of that is under, so what do we know about the situation? And then uh, that might help to redefine our problem now that we know what our people's lived experience. We came in thinking this is a problem, but actually, the problem is actually different. So we might have to redefine our problem statement and then going into what 
possible. And that brings in all the resources aspects. How much time do we have at hand, staff time, technical expertise. But I think how, thinking through can allow us to actually tap into resources we may not be because we're in such a rush. But we may actually have resources in our community which are untapped, like our academic institutions, our nonprofits, the different committees. So really thinking through uh, what's possible, what's available to us. And then, um, yeah, and then coming in to an understanding of what can we do. Thank you. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, we've got to determine the likely cost of the pros solutions and necessary resources. The resources are not just financial, right? They're human, they're cultural, they're community. They're, you know, so thinking beyond just financial resources is um, helpful. Anna. Yeah, so my flowchart, I love, y'all should, I love a good flowchart. Uh, so it's a weird interest, apparently. Um, my, uh, my flowchart followed a similar sort of breakdown when Alicia was talking about the three phases. I was like, oh yeah, I kind of, mine fits within that, I, that idea. I think the one thing, and I won't read through it if anyone wants to look, it's got a lot of pretty arrows, but one of the things, two of the things that I think were missing that as I was thinking through this came up for me, one of them, we have reflect on the why, but we don't necessarily have reflect on the how. So I think that's the question of like, is this a resolution? Is this a bylaw? Is this like, what form is this going to take? Um, and I think that's pretty critical. And then uh, Dorothy reminded me of something as well that came up of when we consult town staff, one of the questions is who should actually, if it's a bylaw, who should be writing it, right? And so I think that while we have a lot of very capable, well, I'm gonna go ahead on a limb and say we are all very capable people, uh, we might not always be the people who should actually be drafting bylaw language. I'm gonna say most of the time, we should probably not be the people who are drafting bylaw language, but our town staff, especially in areas around zoning and planning and things like that are very capable and knowledgeable. And so where is that line too in the process of, you know, how are we engaging town staff, considering capacity, considering like all, doing all of that in, in one go um, and then determining the how, do, are you getting all this on one sticky note, Erin? Uh, yeah. <laughs> determining the how. So um, <laughs> the how of actually drafting, I think, is the question. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's a that's a lot of. Should we add those as sticky notes? I right. think are they embedded? In I can synthesize if you'd like me to. That'd be great. Thank you. So <laughs> I think because it's it's very short on my paper. Uh, consider the how, bylaw, resolution, etc. Ah, uh, see, I knew this was okay. The resolution, et cetera, okay. And then I'm gonna say, consider the who of drafting, right? So consider who writes it. Obviously there's about 10 minutes of talking wrapped up in what that means, but mm -hmm. I think that covers it. Is that it? I, I'm going to make this pile of mess into something over lunch. I promise. Right now, it looks overwhelming, and it's going to feel a little bit, a little bit more coherent. But this is really helpful. Um, so I have Shalini at the top. Is that is your hand still raised, or and Anna? No worries, Jennifer. Um, yeah, mine's almost a question. If of because I'm still grappling with how you actually move something through the process. So I, I put this, so this is kind of, is this how we would do it? I guess, identify, once we've decided on a priority, identify other counselors who share the priority, advocate to get issue on the agenda, consult relevant town staff with town manager's permission, consult key sta stakeholders and those whose voices haven't been heard, get feedback from supporters and naysayers, learn what's been accomplished in this area, maybe in other towns, and then draft and propose solution or legislation and gather support. Okay. I'm asking if that's the process. Thank you. Yeah, it sounds relatively similar to some of what we would be heard, we've heard here, which is really helpful. Kathy. I I do think this way about flowcharts. So it's, um, but I just, 
everyone has put almost all the steps I would have on. I just was, um, so I'm not sure it's more words, but at the very beginning, the understanding the problem, um, we could put, this is the problem, but what's the nature of the problem? Mm -hmm. There's, and it depends on what we're looking at. Sometimes it's pretty clear what the problem is. Mm -hmm. um, too many cars on the road with no place to park or something, but understanding the problem is, because the problem statement will either resonate with a lot of people or they say, ah, you know, I wouldn't have defined it that way. And then when we get to, and I'm not thinking of the simple ones where we're just writing a bylaw, but we're looking at options and we don't all agree on them, finding, getting to yes. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of building a consensus, building support for it. And Lynn mentioned implementation complexity, but I don't think we think about that as much. Is there one way that's easier to go? Um, there's another way that they all sound good, but you know, it's Paul will tell us I need 10 more staff to even begin to do that. So it's the complexity for us to do it, but also for the people in town to even understand what we did, you know, that there are too many different things going on. So we will, we have had those kinds of issues and I don't think we pay enough attention to them. Thank you. Yeah, and the, um, the piece about understanding the nature of the problem too, I would encourage you to think about that as an evolving thing that, you know, some of these are steps like we do this and then we figure that out and we move to the next step. Some of these are things that can be circled back to repeatedly, right? Because as you do whatever research or benchmarking or data, it's, you might discover, in fact, I hope you discover that the problem is different than we thought it was in the first place, right? Because if that doesn't happen, then we're coming in with preconceived notions and we're engaged in confirmation bias and we're essentially just, you know, only pursuing the thing that we think is the right thing, right? So giving yourself space for these things to evolve and to kind of return to them throughout the process is really helpful too. Pam. Well, you just took most of the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I see this as a, as a, uh, a planning cycle. And it's such a, it's a, every, everything that we deal with is a sort of a planning cycle. And that's the, again, sort of picking or identifying the problem statement. It goes to the, it goes a little bit to the phasing that Alicia talked about. So you have the problem statement, the input and all of the considerations um, being open for the unexpected uh, testing, testing out the hypotheses, testing out the, the implications of it, uh, an implementation phase, and then a tweaking. And it's it, any, any process, it should be iterative. And the iterative part of that is adding in the unexpected that you discover and you learn, or the voices that you haven't heard before. And it's just a, um, it's, it's a cycle. And, um, so lots of us who like to, to plan and, and go through the cycle, you know, may never feel like we've um, tied everything up in a tidy bow because there wasn't a definitive endpoint. Um, because in fact, we're always open to more ideas. So there has to be a balance of those who definitely just want to get to the end line and those who want to continue planning. And I think that's part of the tension of decision making is some people are, are ready to finish earlier than others. Mm -hmm. So, but it is a, but it is iterative. That was my main point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But I also love that, that observation that each of each council member has a different level of patience with various moments within these, right? Some of you, you know, you probably can pick your favorite sticky note here where you're like, I'm in my element when I'm in the decide whether to keep going or whatever. It, it's the first one I saw, but, um, you know, there may be one where you're like, that's the place where I can shine, like learn that about each other too, and draw on each other to bring that out, to say like, I'm actually really terrible at even knowing how to approach, you know, finding out whose voice isn't included. Can I figure out who on the council can help me with that? Right. So, um, learn what, you know, each of you has as superpowers and notice when someone's like, bye, I can't, you know, and, and, and support them through those, those uh, areas where they're maybe less strong. Yeah. Thanks, Pam. Shalini. Wait, Michelle, did you want to go first? Because I, I've already spoken. Yeah. 
So this is all really amazing. Um, but I would add that consider identifying counselors who don't share your priority um, to work with. And that for one can be strategic when it comes to a vote <laughs> in particular, um, but it also gives you a chance to sort of check any bias that you may be holding about a particular person. Um, and I think it's really easy for us to sort of create permanency around people and think that this person's in this box and this person's in this box. And what I've discovered is that that's not true. <laughs> um, and when I have uh, gone out of maybe my comfort zone or spoken to somebody who I didn't think necessarily shared my point of view or priority, I always learn that there's much more nuance. Um, so that's something I would add is to identify counselors who may not share the priority. Thank you. Shani. One other thing I would add is what at each stage, who's doing what? who's doing what at each stage, because, uh, you know, when we're gathering, let's say, information, is the staff gathering the information for us? Are we supposed to be individually? Because I end up doing a ton of research and going out, and that becomes my main job then, <laughs> because I'm so obsessed with understanding. So having some clarity around, you know, who who's doing what role at different stages, and and who can we pull in because the staff gets overburdened too. So can we, you know, like, I don't know, but you get what I'm saying. Like who's doing what? I do get that. All right. Oh, Lynn. No, just one more. And then once you introduce it, understand the process from when it's introduced to when it is finally happens. Okay, bylaws take a lot of steps, proclamations take fewer, that kind of thing. Thanks. We're right on time, people. Isn't that amazing? I'm so excited. It's rare that that happens for me, but we're um, at 1230, we're going to take a lunch break, but I just want to um, thank you for taking some time to think about these different steps. And, it, you know, the, the thing to remember is that for each priority area, again, the process might look a little different, but the best you can do is to decide in advance, how do we wanna tackle this together so that you can be intentional about it and then let that process evolve as it needs to evolve, right? So you know, planning with flexibility is sort of the idea here. So during the lunch break, I'm going to try to organize this based on kind of what I've heard as some general areas so that it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming. So that it's sort of like, here's what it could look like. And then our last piece together is to actually apply this to a particular one of these priorities, not to get to a solution or even share what we think the solutions are, but to think a little bit more specifically, if we were to do this, who would be the people we would need to talk to? What kinds of things would we need to consider? So we're gonna get a little bit more specific by applying process and thinking about each step and how it relates to, wait for it, parking. So <laughs> more parking. Um, so any instructions we need to give folks for lunch? Yes. Um, so sandwiches and drinks are, and chips are out there. There are places you, a couple people can sit in, in, into that room. We'd like to depopulate the room and you probably want a different view anyway. There's a room right next to this that can hold a few people. The first floor conference room can hold more people. Those are all the spaces and some people can stay in here if they choose, but we encourage you to sort of get out and see something else. Same doors unlocked, yes. All right, how long? We're gonna pick up again at one o'clock. But like on computers ready to go at one o'clock. Yeah. Not like meandering in. You I know. need the clarification, otherwise I'll be like, I'm in the room, this counts, right? Ready to go at one o'clock, please, Anna. Thank you. I'm on it.
get us back to live. Got it. Okay. Erin, it's back to you. Great. All right. Welcome back from lunch. One of the great things about masks is that you cannot see all of the pesto that's in my teeth right now. <laughs> You'll never know, but I get to like enjoy it for the rest of our session. Um, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry, that's really gross. Okay. Um, <laughs> didn't someone say authenticity was their favorite value? Because I'm here for that. I am, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, Pam has a hand raised. Do you have something you'd like to share? I do. Um, there was a baby born at about 1230 while you all were lunching. So that's the good news. Congratulations. Congratulations. So exciting. It, um, if you leave, feel free. I mean, no one will ask any questions. Uh oh. I think I'm echoing. Okay, are we good? I think we're good. All right, let's dig back in. Okay, parking, let's tackle that. Um, okay, so we just, before lunch, we uh, had a chance to kind of think about process and how, what, you know, how we might design process. And so I did my best while I was eating to kind of organize some of those sticky notes, which I'll show to you in just a moment. Um, but what I thought we would, it might be helpful to do is to get a little bit more specific on one particular issue that is on your list of priorities to kind of think about what would it mean for this particular issue if we were to follow that process. So um, I'm going to pull us out of the slide deck and head over to the Jamboard again. Um, and this is the best I could do to try to organize based on what I heard um, uh, in terms of how these things might unfold. And so these are sort of higher level categories of um, sort of buckets that I heard you all starting to pull things together into, um, beginning with arriving at a shared subset of council priorities. Um, and then you can see there are the sub uh, sticky notes. Unfortunately, the text has to get really small in order to fit these all in these uh, columns. But you know, if you need to kind of zoom in for yourself, you can. Um, so starting there, uh, then moving to understanding the nature of the problem. So there were a handful of sticky notes that kind of um, fit into that category. Then moving to finding our why and connecting our, um, to our values. And uh, I, I put role clarity in here, although you know, so some of these sticky notes might actually apply in multiple places and you could probably make copies of them and put them in multiple spots. Um, I put it there for now, thinking that role clarity is helpful at the beginning with the, with the why and connecting to our values um, stage. Then moving from there to a great big bucket of learning, right? Taking the time to engage town staff, generating and analyzing data, um, considering folks' capacities, uh, benchmarking with similar communities, learning what's already been accomplished in this area. After the learning, moving to generating and considering solutions. So that's the whole solution bucket. Um, and then gathering feedback, consulting multiple stakeholders, their lived experiences and practicalities um, from supporters and naysayers, um, moving from there to proposing and adopting a solution. And then once that solution is adopted, assessing the outcomes. Um, so if you just do all this, then you'll be all set, right? Um, so I would love, to, again, go back into individual reflection and mapping. Take, let's, I'll set a timer again for five minutes. We'll see, check in after those five minutes. Even if you wanna just work at the yellow sticky level, that's perfectly fine. But the, the columns are there for you to kind of think about what did we mean when we said these buckets? But for each one, if we were tackling parking, what kinds of things would we need to do to um, you know, understand the nature of the problem? You know, arrive at a subset of council priorities. Let's assume we arrived at parking as one of our priorities, right? Um, and then you know, what would we need to do to be able to understand the nature of the problem? What kinds of things would we have to figure out related to our why? So this is just a chance to practice with a specific issue. So any questions on what you're supposed to do? Yes, Anna. So it's it's not for you, Erin. It, Lynn, it's, this question's for you. And I asked it before because I wasn't sure if I missed something. The sticky note of advocate to get the issue on the agenda. Um, so this is one that based on what I just asked you for half an hour ago, seems like should be on there twice. I'm not saying you need to do it, but should be on there twice. And it kind let me ask this as a question. 
do you need to advocate to get it on the agenda twice, once generally to establish it as a priority? And then again, once you have something that you're pitching. Okay. The way I manage the future agenda items is that if I know an item is going to happen sometime, it is in a category that's kind of the third or second category in my future agenda items, which I still have to share the whole thing with you. Um, it, so that I know it's out there, but I haven't brought it up to an actual date of a meeting, okay? And there's times I might take it off the list because it's not gonna be out there anymore. But it's, to the extent possible, they're all somewhere on this, I don't know, four or five page document, okay? Any other questions before we do some, oh, <coughs> yes, uh, Dorothy. So you said that the colors of the sticky notes were random. They're not anymore. Yeah, I wanna know how that happened. Um, so here, check it out. So on this page, this is the mess that we created earlier. And then I copied everything over and then I color coded them. Okay. Yes, thanks. I didn't clarify that. I appreciate the, the point of, of clarification. Shalini. With respect to parking, are, are there are many different pieces to it. So, uh, what are we? They all require different processes. So, what are we looking at? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So, one of the things that we were considering as we were developing this agenda is recognizing that there are sort of there's almost like this ladder of or a set of umbrellas, or we also played with like Russian nesting dolls or whatever kind of analogy you want to use in terms of like there's parking, then there's downtown parking or there's a uh, garage, is that an option, right? So I would say dive in at whatever level feels right to you and where it feels like you can get traction and make sense around practicing thinking through process. Um, so I don't have a really good answer to that question other than this is just a chance to start to, to play with this process and, and think about what would it actually look like in practice. Is that mildly helpful or not at all? Not helpful. Would you like us to just pick one of them? Okay. Just we, because we, I think we, I'm sorry, because we'll be all approaching it in a very different, we're not solving the same problem. Like we're all solving and then we won't be able to compare and like we won't, it won't be apples to apples. I, I, I really would appreciate us following a process, this like having the same problem that we're tackling because it feels like we're tackling different problems then. And okay. I then I would suggest we do the parking garage. Okay. Okay. Can I go? So I, that's totally fine. And I want to acknowledge that in doing that, we started the process, right? So like the arriving at the set of council priorities, if parking is the priority, nailing it down to the garage would be part one of the process. I agree that it makes the rest of this easier for today, but like, just want to note that that is part of step one. Right, so if step one is understanding the nature of the problem, I think part of what you're doing right now is raising the question of what problem are we actually solving, right? So then think about what kinds of questions would we need to ask to be able to do that? And then for the sake of the rest of the exercise, maybe imagine you've arrived at one solution, et cetera. You know, again, we are not gonna arrive at a solution to parking by the end of this. This is just an opportunity to do the mental exercise. Does that work? Okay, great, thank you. All right, I'm going to set the timer for five minutes and I'll check back in with you.
puts us at five minutes. I see people are still writing and, and working. We could give it another two and I can check back in. How are we doing? Does anyone need another minute? I'm seeing eyes looking up mostly. Great. Okay, so I think before digging into some of these steps, I just would love to hear some thoughts on the overall experience of trying to apply a theoretical process to an actual issue. Did, where did you notice yourself getting stuck or ask, where did you have questions? Where did it feel more challenging than others? Um, just any sort of overarching thoughts. And then I think it might be helpful for us to think about, you know, if we were looking at parking, what did you notice in the understanding the nature of the problem column and then kind of march our way through. So first sort of overarching observations. Um, it looks like Mandy has a hand. Um, difficult because it's so theoretical still. Um, like I, I can't do the propose and adopt a solution unless we've talked about stuff because then I'm bringing my biases into what I believe the solutions are and I don't know whether there's options. So I actually found nearly every step of talking about even the problem without having a conversation, writing my, it's, it's all my thoughts, but I found every step hard. That is such a great revelation for oneself too, to recognize like, oh, we can't know how it's going to end until we do these earlier pieces to the puzzle. So thank you. Yeah, Shalini. I think uh, for me, articulating the problem itself, like the problem wasn't like, should we have a parking garage or not or where? The question was like, what is the problem statement? What are, what are we solving for here? And so for me, us coming to an agreement as a council, which I think is a little ambiguous, why are we wanting this? And so like for me, it was the statement was how to make our downtown accessible for people visiting and enjoying our downtown like a starting statement, but but so I think for me, that was the first thing that even as a town to come together as and articulate what is the problem we're solving for. Thank you, Pam. Yeah, that's actually a really good starting point. Um, I like the thought of going through a process like this um, because it actually takes the time to open up what are the considerations that need to be on the table. And I think um, it's our tendency to perhaps jump into solutions and not take the time to ask if, in fact, we should be broadening our consideration of other opportunities. So I think going through a, um, 
a slightly more formalized process for thinking about parking as this one example, um, I think is, is very valuable for us rather than jumping to, we want, we want to make the downtown more accessible, therefore we need a garage. It, it asks us to step back and say, you know, what, what are we trying to achieve? And are there other ways, are there many ways to accomplish this? Is the garage the best solution? So I think this process is terrific to think through. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Jennifer. Yeah, I was really struck by just something, you know, as sort of unglamorous as a parking garage, how many of those apply? I mean, you, you know, from considering who has the information and other pieces needed, it was just, it, it was almost every box could apply to trying to solve this problem. But I did um, notice on one of the uh, squares where I don't know how the language got there. It says supporters and naysayers. I don't know if the word naysayers <laughs> seems, to um, seems to have a little bias there. So maybe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to shift yeah. language. I think it was for and against. <laughs> I, I think the word was used in the room. I can't remember how, but um, what, is there a better word that you'd propose? Or it's just or both sides of the yeah. issue, all sides of the issue. Sure. Yeah. Those who are pro and those who are against. I mean, yeah, it doesn't really matter. I think it's it's more just there will be people in support. There will be people in opposition. And you want to talk to both of them. Can I please add just to that since we're on that? because there's a whole bunch of people who are complacent. And I think we need to also include them, like how do we bring more people into the conversations? I agree, there's, it's a spectrum. Okay. Great, thank you. Alicia. Um, so I had a similar experience to Mandy Joe when I did this, that was like just my realization mostly. And then also just that what you were saying in the beginning is that a lot of these sticky notes can be copied and moved to other places. So for example, when I got to the generate and consider solutions there, um, if I want to, I then also wanna ask like, who would I be doing this with again? Because I was thinking about like, if I'm benchmarking in the step before and I'm looking at what other communities are doing, who's doing that research, me? or do I do it with other people? Mm -hmm. um, and so like there were other things, I would basically, steps that I would be doing multiple times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets, all, it gets really complicated, right? Like you could make a really complicated flow chart that had lots of arrows pointing to various places with lots of repeat pieces, but I think that's a, such a great observation. Dorothy. Great. I'm curious, and I'm not looking for an answer to this, but I'm curious if with all of these priorities, that's a similar way of approaching this, right? To say, I mean, it makes a lot of sense that at the beginning of your work together, you're gonna really be in this space of like understanding the nature of the problem before trying to jump to solutions. And so if that's a piece that you take away from this, that's, that's helpful, but also recognizing that if we only get stuck in 
constant grinding around what is the nature of the problem, we never actually come to solutions, right? So finding that balance in the work and continuing to move a process forward while being really conscious of redefining the problem, that's, that's a tricky balance to, to take. Yep. It looks like Kathy, you've been renamed council retreat, but. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I, I guess I just build on, I, I agree with the statements that have been made on the, this particular issue, but I want to contrast it to one other that we worked on. Mm -hmm. um, and this was Pat, Mandy and I worked on something called wage theft or responsible employer. Um, it started with the definition of the problem that most people agreed with. And we were able to find multiple other towns that had done something about it and could document it. So it, it created however long it took to get that through. By the time we got through, there wasn't a disagreement about what the problem was. Hmm. So it, that was a really important piece to being able to define that because it, it built consensus um, in a way that uh, I think was helpful. Yeah, that's such a helpful way of thinking about this too, that even though each one of these pieces is the same, takes up the same amount of space on this page, they're gonna take different amounts of time space depending on the problem itself, right? So some things might get really caught up in the defining the problem. And then once we've figured out what the problem actually is, it might be very quick to come to the solution because we've done that really good work of understanding what are we trying to solve in the first place, right? Other, other problems might have pretty easy sort of early identification of the problem and, and take all of its time up in the solution generation, right? So recognizing that there, there can be some of that elasticity um, well, as long as we're keeping our eye on forward movement as opposed to being kind of stuck and spinning our wheels. Andy. Um, one thing, um, when Dorothy spoke, I did not hear anything she said because she didn't use her microphone. So I just ask everybody to please use their microphone. Uh, my one, when I went through the um, steps that were um, outlined it was all working well until i got to the column learn and i just had the observation that i didn't know what it was we were learning we didn't um we need to identify what information do we need in order to figure out what it is that you take to go to the town staff or wherever what is it we are trying to uh, to, to achieve in that column. Thanks, Andy. Lynn. So my problem that I had was going all the way to the beginning of this, and it's because for this particular issue, I think where an individual counselor may come from is based on what their vision is for our downtown. And that that vision for our downtown may be a significant driver, therefore, of how we would even approach this question. So it's how do we deal with the fact that this actually may be a piece of a much bigger question. Great. Yeah, it's bringing us back to that point that there's umbrellas and smaller pieces within, right? And so also being able to think about this, the problem that we're working on right here, how does it link up the chain and down, right? In terms of the, the levels of, of work that we're doing. Shalini. Yeah, in response to what Lynn just said, I had thought about it as like, who is this impacting? Uh, how is it going to impact them? And what are our values around this? situation. So if there's seniors who are visiting, how it's impacting them is the walkability aspect and safety and all of that. And then what are the values we have? We have houseless people who come to downtown. They don't need the parking garage. But you know, it's like just considering who is getting impacted, how that would help us keep the conversation centered around our values and the problem. But what I was also hearing and notice realizing is that as Dorothy said, I think that different people have different information, who has access to information. And very often there has been work done, uh, but it's behind the scenes or 
uh, it was done before our term. So for example, there were two downtown studies with hundreds of people, residents that show that parking, if you look at what they wanted, parking was one of the top things. They said, we need more parking downtown. But now the new people who come in do not were not part of that in a study. So the problem comes of what Anna was saying, we don't trust each other's work. And part of the trust not being there is that we don't have systems of situating all the information in a way that's easily accessible. And so yeah, a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah, I just wanted to add a few things with the parking one in particular. Um, who we're listening to, as Shalini said, is really important because a lot of times we think of it as just we need the residents' views. But for something like parking, we need the visitors' views. How do you get visitors' views? You know, like, or are those views similar to the outlying residents' views? We have you know, for something like a downtown parking, at least in previous discussions, we saw there were a potentially varying different um, stakes depending on where you lived in town as to whether downtown parking, where your view might be on downtown parking. So I think we have to recognize that. And then I also caution spending too much time in the learn, generate solutions, um, and all of that, this town loves to study stuff, but we do have to make decisions even if we don't have all the information, even if we don't have half the information. At some point, we're, we, this town would get stuck in studying on everything. Um, and so I think one important thing is to recognize at some point you have to move on. So maybe the timeline of when you're going to make a decision really becomes important on um, deciding how much learning you can do um, or not, because you need to move forward at some point. Yeah, the learn stage is always um, imperfect, right? Because you can't talk to every single citizen, every person who ever comes to Amherst. And, you know, I mean, like it's impossible to do that perfectly. So you always have to put imperfect boundaries on that, right? Yeah. Pat. I'm not sure exactly. How, I've gone off on a different, slightly different tangent, building on what Kathy shared about Mandy and she and the three of us working on wage theft. We had a common understanding. We did a lot of this process uh, as our steps, and then we brought things to the council. But I'm trying to figure out, and that, that's an incredible process. I'm trying to figure out how we as a body do this because of open meeting law, we can't do a lot of this. So how, um, I guess we can do it publicly, but how do we do that? I mean, I know how to work in the smaller group. I know how to invite challenge in there, um, but how do we do this as a, as a larger body? And, and so that's the question I'm putzing with in my brain. Thanks. Jennifer, you had a hand. Did you what? Okay. Kathy. Just building on what Pat said to bring it back to garage parking, you know, big things. We have committees that are assigned topics and they may arise. If you're not on the committee, you get three minutes to talk about something. So we haven't developed a way of creating a uh, legal public place where we're discussing it, gathering information together that if others want to bring information to the group, it doesn't violate the public meeting laws. You know, so in, it's efficient to have the committees working on it. I'm just saying that we can't put everyone on everyone, every committee. So we don't have what Pat just said, we don't have a way of going from small groups can talk to each other. Um, to how does the larger group get to a comfort level? Because the small group's supposed to bring a solution to us. You know, that's their charge. It's not, they're not supposed to bring the problem to us. So it's, it's developing a way to do that would be extremely useful. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like a design challenge in terms of the structure of how you all work together, right? So it would be thinking about how do we, how do we lay something like this over top of, of that? Um, 
Anna, you had a hand up. Yeah, so to me, this is not the committee work, but this is that small group work, right? And so for me, there's maybe a post-it that should go at the beginning where we, to be clear, we do not violate open meeting law, but we say, you know, Mandy and Anna are working on a, uh, you know, are examining the role that elephants play in Amherst. If you have anything you think we need to know, just tell us, we're not gonna to respond to you, but tell us like what information you would wanna see in that. Tell us what questions you have so that we then in our small group can go through this process and you know, consider Kathy's hot takes on, is this gonna hurt the peanut industry in town? So like, I think that, that that's where we can anticipate. I'm going way hypothetical because clearly we're not ready for reality. So, so like, I think, I think that's where in that first column, the set of council priorities, that's where this chart is so helpful. And again, it comes back to that, the trust thing of saying, I know that Kathy's concerned about the, the peanut industry. And so I'm gonna make sure that I look really deeply into that and include it in the, the information that I then report back. I'm not saying that I'm relying on Kathy to be a part of this small group. And I'm not saying that I'm gonna discuss it with her, right? Until we have something that's ready to present. And that's the other part that I think when we get to that propose and adopt a solution that's really important is that we're not just presenting the one solution, we're also explaining how we got there. Um, and so we're, we're showing that we did that work and that doesn't need to be in a really long drawn out way, but I do think that's an important part. We've talked about memos and things like that. It's, it's important that we understand the, the narrative behind some of these things so that we can see that it was done. We can see what the process was as well. I, I would really like um, Athena and maybe Paul to weigh in on the suggestion that Anna just made. Thank you. You can always rely on me to, to get the, <laughs> bring the hammer down on small group meetings um, because if the council were to designate a group of people to meet together on a subject to bring back to the council, that's a subcommittee. So it's different if, three counselors have something they're passionate about, they wanna work on something together. The council hasn't designated those people to do that, but they're doing it together like um, someone mentioned about the wage theft bylaw. Um, so there are a little, a couple of open meeting law things to consider in those instances. Can I clarify? Sure. Okay, so, so then if I'm looking at this sheet and I say elephants, Anna and Mandy are on there, I don't wanna be involved and I we're not designating this as a, as a group that's working on it, but I'm gonna tell them, hey, if you ever do pursue that, I wanna know the impact on peanuts, that's okay. Cause we're not saying it as a group, right? Like we just are looking at this list. Okay, I'll, I'll bring it into reality. So we say, okay, BL zoning. I know Mandy Joe's interested in that. I know I'm not interested. If she chooses to pursue that as a, as a priority, I wanna know X, Y, Z. Can I then share that and just say, hey, Mandy Joe, if you're interested in, if, you're, if you do pursue this, could you make sure to include this? Like, if you as an individual know that Mandy's interested in doing something and you have that conversation with her offline, that's fine. But if the council says these people are working on something together, that's a subcommittee. Great. Okay. So that helps us at least kind of understand what are the what are the rules around whether what kind of work we can do here. Um, we are, we're not gonna solve parking today, right? That's not the whole point. The, the, um, the point was uh, essentially to get a sense. I'm sorry, I'm like, no. Actually, that's what was like keeping me awake when we first started this relationship about the, developing an agenda. I was like, I'm not gonna be able to get them to you know, come together around any of these, the big first meeting. Um, but my hope is that you were able to at least kind of get a sense of what this process could look like. Um, and to figure out how does that work given the relationships that we have. Um, it does require mutual trust. It does require uh, a willingness to move forward and move on even when you feel like maybe you haven't fully fulfilled one of these stages, right? And so um, having both patience, but also a collective sense of trying to, to move um, the process forward. Um, but this is this is the hard stuff, right? But to do it well, and then to be able to document and share and be transparent about process um, is is half of the battle. And so 
Uh, one thing I'd love to, for us to do with this before we, we're gonna close out by two o'clock, but I wanna stick with this for just one more minute. And you're, actually- You're gonna close out by two o'clock. I'm but gonna be done by we're two. We're actually here till maybe three, maybe not. Yes, okay. yeah. So I, my portion of the agenda, sorry, I should have made that clear, is done at two o'clock. Um, but before we move from the, this process and analyzing it, I want to bring us back to our values and circle right back to the beginning of our conversation together. And so just take a moment, please, to re, like, bring those back forward so you can, in your packet, um, return to page 29. And the question I have for you, and again, I'm going to give you just a couple minutes to reflect on it. When you're looking at this process, if we were to follow this process, where are we most likely to need to call on or return to or reinforce these values with each other as we engage in this work? And so think about in the process, we are definitely going to need to you know, really return to X value at why moment that's what i'm getting you to try to do some reflection on so where do the values now map to process is the question Take just another 30 seconds. And our hope, of course, is that our values will be a thread through all of our work all the way through, right? So it's not like, oh, we turn on respect during this section, but not over here. But I am curious, you know, if you look at this, are there moments where you can see where one of them might get especially challenged and we need to make sure that we're returning to it? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Um, Kathy, you have a hand up. Was that from the previous comment? Okay, um, Shalini. Um, I was think uh, for me, the, uh, for the first step of problem, artic articulating a problem, I thought of the values of community participation, diversity, inclusion, environmental sustainability, uh, and respect is really playing a role, like in terms of really bringing that lens to who is this impacting, how is it, imp you know, are we including all the voices and who's going to be impacted, um, how is it impacting our value of environmental sustainability, and of course, maintaining that respect that you know, initially they'll be like, oh, I don't agree with that. And so reminding ourselves to have that. And then like in, in a different stage where we're considering uh, different solutions, that's where more of the other values of creativity, innovation, and you know, of course they all go through everything, but that comes later. Great, thank you. Anna. So woof. Uh, community participation felt like one of the very clear steps in the process a, a few different times. The, the ones I thought, I think the creativity and innovation by, its, by the way it's explained here will both guide our discussion and be a one we need to be reminded about. 
of that it's okay to do things differently and move forward. Um, and that we can also learn from what has been done and trying to find where in that we kind of settle. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, environmental sustainability, and fiscal responsibility feel like the questions we always need to ask of how is this moving those goals forward? Um, how is this fiscally responsible? How is this supporting our sustainability and resilient climate resilience efforts? And um, how is this advancing, advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice in town? Um, those for me are three questions that need to be asked regardless of what project it is. Thank you. Alicia. Uh, so I, I think I looked at this a, a little bit differently because I, I see these values as all of them needing to be applied across the board all the time. And so how I look at this more is in that when we're engaging in each of these steps on the sticky notes, how are we showing these values while engaging in those things? Um, so like, for example, when we're in the process of proposing and adopting a solution, like are we, are we being sure that we're sticking to our goals of being creative and innovative? Um, and like when we're engaging the community, are we sticking to our goals of diversity, equity, and inclusion? And so like how we can actively show these values through the steps that we're taking, if that makes sense. It absolutely does, thank you. Dorothy. Well, I would say that the, uh, the first two can include the others. Um, with community participation, we have to solicit it and we have to respect it when we get it. And then for creativity and innovation, that's us, the town council, accepting the challenge of the problem and also reaching out to that community participation where we have a lot of talent and figuring out how to do the thing that we have decided needs to be done within the framework of the rest of the values. So those are the two I think are the most important. Jennifer. Um, yes, and I, I guess I would add, you know, for community participation, we're always gonna find members of the community on all sides of the issue. So how do we kind of balance that? You know, we'll all point to the people from the community that are reinforcing our, our point of view, but um, how to try and reach consensus. And then of course, transparency, because sometimes we do hear, well, this work was done before, but if we don't really know what that was, then it, it may even feel like something was, is especially being done behind the scenes for some reason. So transparency, I think, again, all these values apply to everything in every square. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. So I guess the thing, the reason why I wanted to circle us back here is because it is so easy often to get in the work and then forget about the larger overarching things that matter to us, right? And so I would encourage you as you are in the work and doing each of these sort of minute pieces and steps along the way, to be stopping to think about how are we you know, incorporating our values? Does this work and the ways that we're carrying it out reflect what matters to us? Um, and to be doing that by thinking both internally and externally. And that's all really hard to do all at once, right? So you'll, you'll probably need each other's support for that. So I know you all are staying together beyond two o'clock, but my portion of this ends at two. And I wanted to have a chance to do a, just a, a quick little closing. We, we open with an icebreaker. I wanna close um, by asking you to take a moment to jot down for yourself and then share out one key takeaway or point of gratitude or thing that's kind of coming, you're coming away with um, from the work that we just did together today it would be helpful for me to hear that. And I think also helpful for you to be able to kind of pull together. Like if there's one thing I, I remember from this, it'll be this key point. So take a minute to write that down and then we can do another share out. And Lynn, do you mind just doing the call, the roll call again in the same way? Do you hate that? Oh. <laughs> remember, you can always pass and come back. <laughs> All right, well, yes. Yeah, so take a moment to write it down. I know some people you know, need a moment to, to process and then we'll do a share out.
So take like 20 seconds to finish jotting down. Are we ready? Almost, maybe. <laughs> All right, so I'm really going to shake it up. I'm going to start in the back of the alphabet. Alicia. <laughs> Um, so mine is a little bit long, but I think like overall, what I'm coming out of this is although we have these shared values here that we apply in our council meetings, we all really do have different values or different things that we prioritize. Um, we have different ways that we approach things. We have different goals. Um, but that, that is what's going to make us a strong council. And so that if we can really truly find a good way to work together through our differences and how we can utilize our different superpowers and then also uphold each other in the places where we're not as strong, that we will be a very powerful and strong group and we will make a lot of progress. Um, so I'm looking forward to working with you all. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, well, first I, really appreciate being able to have this time all together, not in a formal meeting. It's really the first time we've been able to do that. Um, and I, I very much appreciate having these values, you know, written and highlighted here so that we can refer back to them and kind of self-correct if we veered away from applying the values to, you know, the different uh, priorities we'll be addressing. Um, and as Alicia said, yeah, we, we do have different priorities. I think we may have a lot of shared overall goals for what our vision for the town, but it is, I think, also our strength because I think we do represent a lot of the differing, different perspectives that are in the community. So I think that's a good thing. Andy. Andy, you need to unmute. Yeah, it took me to. Uh, so, so, what I came up with was uh, that the council process can achieve important goals for the town and remain committed to our values. And I also um, concluded, and I think it's similar to what has been previously said that whether we are district or at large um, counselors, we are a group that has, has and will work together to achieve what is best for the entire town. Um, Pam? No, Kathy, I'm sorry, Kathy. Sorry, I want to start out by thanking people who chose our facilitator because I thought this was what we just went through for me. I completely agree with what Alicia just said, but I think it was extremely helpful to hear the way people think and approach problems because it will make it much easier to think that I, I come at it this way, you come at it that way, and we're both coming at it for a similar reason. So. Uh, I thought that was excellent. Even where we put the boxes, it just it gave me insight into each person's way of thinking, which was terrific. Pam. Uh, my takeaway uh, is that I appreciate the, the shared understanding of process. And I think, you know, just the, the organization of, of what we all believe or what we individually came to as a process, um, having a shared understanding of what that process consists of, um, instead of just each of us sort of tackling something in, in our own um, natural state, I think will we'll help build some trust in both the information that's brought forward as well as the outcomes. And I, and I think that's been, um, from the public's perspective, I think the, the, the lack of trust in the outcome and the information, 
information being brought forward has been, um, you know, sort of a tension within the community. And I think ha us sharing a, a sense of the process um, may help heal some of that. Thank you. Dorothy. Uh, well, I guess my main uh, take from this is the importance of defining the problem or the problems. And to get to the root of it, to look at its history, its imports, and its unintended consequences. So then you redefine the problem for this moment, and then we start figure out what should we do to solve that problem. So I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Michelle. Yeah, I, I so appreciate um, what everyone has offered and I've learned from each of you, so thank you. Um, but one key perspective that's really sticking with me, and I think it came from Aaron and Lynn, um, is that we're collaborating with past, present, and future counselors, and that our work is a continuum. And I really appreciate um, that sort of larger perspective on it. Okay. Anika has gone home to get ready for her award. That is public. Mandy Jo? <laughs> Um, yeah, just I, I wanted to say I appreciated the reflection that we had to do on our statement of values and the rules. We put it in three years ago um, at Shalini's great suggestion, but then we never really visited it again and never really talked about it. And so the focus on that today, I thought was very helpful, at least for me to be reminded of what they are and to be reminded that we should really be keeping them in our focus and if we ever lose any of them, we need to talk about why we've either lost it or whether it's not a value anymore or whether there are other values we should be adding. Okay. Um, I, I like the elements of the process and with the realization that while we think it's linear, it's not. It's circular and um, that's an important thing to keep remembering. Okay, Pat, you, oh no, it's Anna, Anna. And I'm, you know, notoriously short in what I say. Uh, so something that I find interesting is being a, a, a new person on the council. When I looked at the values and the, um, the rules and everything, a lot of you had a stake in writing those and a lot of us didn't. And so it was interesting for me in considering, are these values still true, right? Are these still true for the folks who are coming on and didn't have a say in what they are? And so, you know, I was having a little bit of tension for myself and it's not because I don't like them or agree with them, but I think it's hard to come in and be told these are, these are the values, knowing that half of you got to write them, right? Like it's, if it were all starting fresh, this would also be different. So I, I think I was sitting with that tension kind of as I was going through this and, and I'm comfortable because I'm, comfortable with those with the values as written but just wanted to name that and I think the other part of being for me a new counselor is it's like learning a new language and trying not to break the law and not really always understanding if you're doing the right thing and wanting to do 10,000 things right and so part of this was part of the realization for me looking at that list is we cover a lot of ground there's a lot of things we want to do and so it's really exciting that we don't all wanna do the same thing because it makes me feel like we'll get a lot done. Hopefully I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist. Um, and the other part of that is it's a lot less daunting when you, have, when you have an idea of a process, right? And I know that what we were talking about is that more informal part of our process because for me, that's the part that was so confusing is I wanna do this and I have no idea how to start, right? And so this really helped build a runway, I think for, for me at least, um, which was much needed. Pat. Thank you, Madam President. <laughs> um, I have two things that I, I uh, am taking away and feel grateful for. One is the reminder that if we step aside from our positions and assumptions, uh, we can find really fertile ground to, to work together for change for, and, and for innovation. And the other thing is the realization that, again, that in the very ways that we are different, we can find our strength. Um, and, and that feels really important to me. 
Shalini. Well, I'm going to start with uh, an important value, appreciative joy, and that we all do such hard work in council. And I really do appreciate and I'm grateful uh, that really came alive today, seeing everyone, you know, coming so much from their heart and authenticity. And, you know, we can all see that we really care about what we're doing and, and we take, really take this seriously. So I think appreciating each other for that and taking like this retreat, as some of us stated, was really nice that we are uh, sort of celebrating us, you know, it's uh, so bringing some joy into that fuels, continues to fuel our work is important. And um, this also helps, I think, the mood enhancers. <laughs> <laughs> that might be part of it. Uh, and then I, I was just thinking in terms of taking forward uh, two things. One, that maybe as committees, we can, from the overall elements of the processes we discuss, maybe each committee can come up with their own process that will work the best for them. And personally, I feel like just because there are new people always in a process that uh, when we're doing work in the committees, we kind of summarize the sources of the research and all the work that's been done. So at least try to level some of the information um, that people who are already working had and new people may not have. So to be more conscious about how to bring forward that information. Thank you so much, Aaron. This was fabulous. So Erin, I think we all want to collectively thank you um, for spending all of the time with us to try to tease out what this might look like and getting us this far, even though we have a long way to go. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. It's been a pleasure working with you. And we may see you again. Well, thank you. I would say my... Um... My key point of gratitude is just being invited in to create this container for you all to be able to do this work together. Um, so I thank you for that. And that my key takeaway is that Amherst is in really good hands with you all. So I wish you so much luck and thank you. It's going to take me at least 10 minutes to clean up all my stuff. So just ignore me over here. But um, thank you so much. It's been really a pleasure working with you all and um, wishing you luck and stay in touch. I'm just in Northampton, so not far away. So thanks. Great. Great. For those of you that did not hear that was Dorothy pointed out that we just broke our own rule and that is we're not supposed to do audible demonstrations but there you go rules are made to be broken sometimes uh, I would like to turn in today's discussion to the next sheet you have, which is the work session priorities. And before we look at, well, what do we think should be those? Because I don't think we're gonna get that far. I think we need to have just a brief discussion about how many work sessions a month you're willing to have. Because with this list, every council meeting could start at 5.30 with a work session. They would not be mandatory. But, you know, you might not want to miss them. So um, do you want to set a guideline? Is it, we're not voting today. Um, is it one a month? Is it, um, sometimes there might be two in succession because the topic is in succession or what might be the situation? Pat. Thank you. I'm having trouble with saying you know, we'd meet at 5.30 before council because I, I'm thinking work sessions uh, could be longer than that and that, that maybe separating them from an actual council meeting um, like we've done today uh, would be very valuable because I think work sessions are valuable and I don't know. Okay. Other comments or thoughts? Uh, I'm sorry. Are you putting back up? Are we still taping? Okay. Oh, it's on the screen. Thank you. All right. Uh, Michelle, 
I just, uh, forgive me if I misunderstood. Um, are we gonna tune in to see Anika receive her yes. award? Yes. Okay. She and I have agreed that when she thinks it's about five minutes out, she's going to text me. Awesome. And then I'm going to abruptly end the meeting. Great. And we're gonna put it up on the screen for those of you that wanna stay or not. It's up to you. Thank you. And for Pam and Andy, if you want to watch, the link is on the Amherst Historical Society website. Um, okay, um, I'm back to Mandy Jeff. Yeah, um, I think what Pat said about maybe separating for some of them might be good. I think too many 530s or very many 530s at all is problematic when our meetings run four hours to five hours already, mm -hmm. you know, and 5.30 start is like eating dinner at four or 4.30 or not eating at all <laughs> for some people, right? Um, but I also wanna keep in mind, we need to look at our own capacity and every work session we add is an extra meeting for all of us um, or those who want to show up. And that, as some of us found last fall, all those extra meetings takes a toll. Um, and so that's not to say they're not good. I don't want people to think that I'm saying we can't do any. I, I think they, I think we need to take a very careful look at what needs a work session, um, what that topic is, how broad or sh short it is, or whether it could be done some other way too. Okay. Great. Anna? Uh, I'm inclined to agree with Pat around and Mandy around the separating them out from the regular council meetings. I think when we also are planning on going into a council meeting after, we all are thinking about what we're going to be doing in that council meeting. And so it's a little bit tough to totally resituate and then think and work together in a, in a different way than we do during meetings, right? So, um, however, I also recognize that adding another date a month, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I can recognize that. And my personal opinion is I'd, I'd rather separate them out. Okay. I'm gonna assume that if we separate them out, we would probably use available Monday nights since that's the one night we kind of all put aside. All right, Kathy. Oh no, yeah, Kathy. Yeah, um, uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, I agree with everything everyone just said about separating them out. And in terms of choosing what we do, um, my strong preference would be, well, I have two thoughts of strong preference. One is, if something is going to come up before us in the course of two years that requires us to do thinking, I think that's a good topic for a work session, you know, where we need some time before we have to make a decision. So I'd use that screen. The other is there's a second thing that was written into the bylaws that's called a public dialogue, which is a little bit different, but they're kind of squishy, like which is we, when we pulled that one, we found it in New Hampshire, I think in a town. Of, and that idea was there's some things that we have community members, not just the council that know a lot about something. And we wanna bring them into the room for conversation. Um, and I think that feels different than a working session where we're gonna be working on something. I mean, not to say that I wouldn't bring someone in. So. So when I looked through our list, I was trying to think which which of these two do I think each of these are. So, okay. thank you, uh, Jennifer. So this is uh, just I guess a question, maybe getting too specific, but I, I admit I've only kind of recently been following, probably since I got on the council, the the school, you know, um, the school building debate in in a little more detail, and. So, I mean, one of my suggestions is, and I'm just wondering if, like, if we wanted to have a dial public dialogue or working session on possible uses for which of the vacant elementary school, is that something that at all informs any decisions or discussions you're having now? Is there a rush on that is what I'm really asking, if we wanted to address that. I'll, I'll just give a quick, the answer is no. And it's not just that, um, Lynn and I, had went, We've got some town properties that were are vacant, you know. So it's like, how do we use our space as well? But that would be a big one to start thinking about that before it's confronting us. Okay. 
Was there anything else, Jennifer? No. Thank you. Darcy. Um, if we have separately scheduled work sessions, I think we'll try to do it avoiding that period when the finance committee goes into its double time meetings. Um, because I think that could kind of help spread the work. Right. Mandy Joe. Yeah, and in terms of timing, if we do them separately from meetings, I would caution that we don't have every month have a work session or three council meetings on top of all the meetings. I, you know, I mean, maybe we should be aiming for four work sessions a year, one a quarter or something like that, where we're not feeling overly burdened. I know the three a month or the four a month that we did at the end of last year, every Monday mm -hmm. and every three out of four Mondays just feels like we don't get a break. And that's the same for staff too. It's not just yeah. the counselors. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, apologize. I misunderstood what that question was, but now that I'm looking at it, I'm wondering if one of the purposes it could serve is to, for the people who are really working on it, to share their research and for the other counselors to ask questions. And I guess that is the purpose. Yes, yes. Okay. So let me just be very straightforward. Between now and there has been a request for two working sessions already. One is a request around the elementary school. And I want to be very careful. It is not, we are not the school committee. We don't determine the education plan. The only roles we have, and they are big ones, is to put it on the ballot as a debt exclusion override and hopefully then vote to appropriate and borrow the money. So if we have a discussion, it can't be like, well, I think you need to do this educationally or whatever. At the same time, I, I'm having a debate with myself, okay? I'm just gonna be straightforward. At the same time, we have two people we have elected as a council to represent us on that committee. And they might like to hear what some of us are having our heads, okay? So the only time I can see us possibly doing that that it would have any possible impact on what's being submitted would be on the 28th. And it would be more like a working session because it's not a vote. There is no vote for us to take. It would be like, gee, have you looked at whatever? Something like that. Mandy Jo, you specifically asked about this. Kathy specifically called me and talked to me about it. So, it would be the 28th at 5.30. It would just be the council. It would not be asking the superintendent to come and plead his case. It would not be creating a public dialogue. I want thoughts on that. I'm testing it out, gang. Use your process. Let, let me just- Kathy. Let me just add one more words to what you just said about the timing, even on asking questions. The we're on a schedule to get what's called a preliminary design to the granting authority, which is seven or eight different options with no decisions made about them. Um, and that's supposed to be signed off by the building committee on March 11th, but it would be previewed by the school committee the week before. So it's an extremely tight timeline <laughs> so in thinking of what this is, it's questions and information that may, may or may not affect the flow. <laughs> okay. Mandy Jo. Yeah, I mean, I, I asked for a public discussion because I think we need to have a public discussion around costs and what goes into costs. And from what I heard from our representatives on the school building committee, some of that decision is being made for that submission on March 3rd that might set some pricing. And I think we as a council, given that we have to vote on things like bonds and whether to ask the people to uh, raise their taxes to pay for a certain building that costs a certain amount, I think we can't shirk that duty by just not having a conversation at this early stage when that conversation could affect 
um, ultimate costs of the building. So I, I don't know whether that's a working session or part of a discussion in a council meeting, but I am very much believe we need to have a public discussion in open meeting about that. Okay. Uh, Alicia. Uh, so I didn't have much specifically to add, but I just wanted to say that I strongly agree with everything that Mandy Joe just said. And that was, I didn't specifically propose it, but that's why I brought it up at the last meeting because I think it would be critical for us to be having these conversations now. Okay. I will look at the agenda and determine whether or not it's 5.30 working session or a discussion item during the regular meeting. And that would be on the 28th. Okay, we just agreed on something, gang. Consensus, we didn't vote. We didn't vote. Kathy? Just one other piece of information when Jennifer said about the building that would remain open. This building, if we can pull it off, will open in 2026. So when I said pick carefully what we do for working sessions, we could do it next year. You know, it, it would, it, you know, in terms of I would pick things for work or dialogue that during this two year cycle are coming before us that we need to discuss, but keep a list of down the road. Okay. And then there were, there was one other sheet and it really arose because um, Jennifer, I think it was asked whether or not we could have a conversation about how do we bring constituent concerns forward and uh, we could all make observations about the constituent concerns. I have my own, you may have your own. Um, but one of the ways you bring them forward is you send something to Paul with CC to me and you ask questions. And actually Jennifer did that on two or three issues and um, got some pretty solid answers. Uh, and I think recently Kathy and Michelle did the same thing for some district one. So I just wanna emphasize again that, you know, Paul's there, he's a resource. He's, he's got more knowledge about these things than any one of us sitting in the room. And, um, you know, and I will try to help and answer stuff, but if things arise to a certain level, then at some point we may wanna think about whether that is a discussion item for council meeting or whatever the case may be. Dorothy. I know I stepped out of the room, you're saying the meeting will be on the 28th of February, but I have a town council on the 20th. We have a town council meeting on the 28th. The question is whether I as president will schedule a working session for an hour before oh, okay. or include as a discussion item in the agenda, the new school proposal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Anna. So this is where I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna pull us back to, to our process here. When we think about our constituent concerns, uh, I think one question that I'm now doing when I'm looking back at this list is saying, does this make sense for a public dialogue? Does this make sense to defer to Paul? Does this make sense for an action item or does this make sense for a working session? I know there are probably more options than that, but that's what I got in my brain. So like, I think that's that would be something I would encourage us to look at these and, and say, all right, if folks are saying, you know, they're really concerned about economic vitality and development, maybe that even though it wasn't the top getter of on our work session priorities maybe that is a way because it's a constituent concern and so we want it to be really accessible in terms of following along with our constituents and working sessions and public dialogues are more open and are more by their nature and by their definition are more open so i would encourage folks to look at this and maybe consider if there are things on here that would make sense for a dialogue or a working session right so what i think we should do with both the combination of the uh, working sessions and the and the constituent interests, okay, is develop our list. We've already identified our next one. If, uh, and there's been another one identified and that would be the area of rent and rent control. So I'm trying to be respectful of people's time, but also understand the timing of certain things. So let me develop the list and we'll start narrowing it down and come up with what we think we need to do next. I wanna make sure we don't miss uh, um, the awards. So unless there's any other final comments, I'm going to declare our meeting adjourned. We, just as a point of information, some of us are going to stay in this room and key into 
the awards ceremony. We will not be in a meeting. We will not be discussing anything. We will not be making any decisions. We just happen to be here and we're watching a video of a meeting together. And others of you may decide this is a time you want to leave. And so I'm going to call the meeting adjourned. Okay. Good job for the meeting.